Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. In 2012 I worked at a tanning salon in a strip mall. It was across the street from a Walmart that was always crawling with strange people. The strip mall that my salon was located in was poorly lit at night. There was a sushi restaurant and an auto zone but other than that, the other stores were vacant. We were open until 10pm while the other two businesses closed around 8 or 9. The salon was never overwhelmingly busy so there was always only one person working at a time. My best friend also worked at the company and the salon she worked at was a 50 minute drive from mine. This detail is important later. I'm a night owl so I worked the 3 to 10 p.m. shift every weeknight. At some point in time, I started getting strange phone calls at 8 p.m. every night. It started off strange but nothing to be alarmed about. The first time he called went something like this. Caller, hi, I am conducting a survey on women's shopping habits and I figured calling a tanning salon run by women would be a good place to start. We also send out a gift if you participate in our surveys. Okay, caller, do you typically wear jeans, yoga pants, leggings, skirts, shorts, or dresses? Feel free to list which of each you wear. Me, I wear all of those. Caller, great. Now when you wear dresses or skirts, do you ever wear pantyhose? Me, not unless it's winter. Caller, so how many tights or pantyhose do you own? Me, I have no idea, like five. Caller, that is great, so would you be interested in us sending you some free pantyhose? Me, I'm not really interested, I don't wear them enough to care. Caller, okay, totally understand. Would it be okay if I call you for a survey in the future? Me, sure. Caller, when do you typically work? Me, every weeknight. Caller, okay, great, talk soon. I shouldn't have given some random person my work schedule but they were already calling my job so there was no denying this person could find me if they wanted. Honestly, I didn't think anything weird about the call at the time. Later in the month we had a store meeting and the weekend sales associate said she had gotten a few weird calls from her guy breathing heavily and asking her questions. She didn't go into detail so I didn't make a connection. The next few times he called me it seemed normal enough. One survey was on skirts and skirt length and brands. The next was about dresses and their links and brands. He kept offering to send me pantyhose though. I kept telling him I don't wear them. He always said okay I just want to make sure I am offering them after every call as it is protocol. Then the last survey he called to have me do really scared me. Caller, when you wear dresses and skirts, do you wear panties? Me, yes. Caller, what material are they? Silk, satin, cotton, lace? Me, I'm not really comfortable with this. I think I'm done with the surveys. Caller, come on, I just want to know what you wear under that dress. I'll bring you some panties and nylons right now. Me, no thank you, please do not come here, goodbye. I hung up and freaked out. I called my friend at the other salon and told her about what just happened. She told me the same guy had been calling her location trying to talk to girls about pantyhose and panties too. She said he had even described to one girl what she was doing while she was on the phone with him. The salon she worked at had glass front windows with a desk facing toward the window. My salon also had a glass storefront with the desk faced the wall. The next few nights were not great. He realized we weren't picking up the calls anymore unless he blocked the number. We had to answer blocked calls because if it was another customer and they complained, we would be in trouble. He started changing up the time of night he called, spoofy numbers, etc. His calls were getting creepier and creepier. Heavy breathing, telling us what we were wearing, saying he was picturing our panties. Really creepy stuff. I was afraid to be at work. I made sure to be on the phone with my friend from the other salon every night for my last hour or so. One day though, the calls just stopped. My salon had a waiting area by the desk when you walked in and then it had a very long hallway with 20 rooms. The last two rooms were the spray tan rooms which needed to be sprayed down each night at close. At the very end of the hallway was a door leading to the dumpsters in the back. To the left of that door was the washer and dryer for used towels and such. This particular night, 20 minutes to close, a weird guy walked in. I had the most intense feeling that this was the creep. I acted normal and asked him his last name. I never been here before. Okay. I explained to him how much a single tan on a regular night cost, like $24. I explained our packages, etc. But I knew my words were falling on deaf ears. He just stared at me with his mouth wide open, breathing heavily. He asked for the most basic bed for 5 minutes. Okay, huge red flag. Why even come in? I put him in the bed and immediately got on the phone with my friend from the other salon. She was the manager at her salon so she decided to close shop early and race over to me just in case I needed her. I had the back door propped open as it was hot in the salon and I wanted to get a cross breeze going while I cleaned the rooms. The dryer was also running which could have impacted my hearing. I was in one of the rooms near the front sweeping when I realized it had been 15 minutes and I hadn't heard this guy walk toward the front door yet. I had hoped he would just leave while I was sweeping up in a room so I wouldn't have to deal with him. So I go down the hall to listen outside the room he was in. The room was empty. He clearly had not used the bed as there were no marks or anything and the glass remained clean. 
I called out to see if he was still in the salon. Sir, no response. I called my friend so fast. I had a horrible feeling of dread. Where are you? I yelled into the phone. I'm pulling up, relaxed. Did he leave yet? She asked. I frantically explained to her what happened and told her loudly so he would hear if he was still in the store. Bring your bat. My friend comes in about three minutes later with a steel bat. Together we started going in rooms one by one. When we got to the sixth room, we heard the back door slam shut hard. We ran to it and locked it. We still checked the other rooms, but we both knew what had happened. He had been hiding in one of the empty rooms and bolted when he realized what we were doing. I don't know what the guy's plans were for me that night, but I'm also thankful my friend was there to save me. So, tanning salon perv, let's not meet. About seven years ago, when I was 17, my parents were out of town for a weekend and left me at home. This is a pretty common occurrence. My parents trusted me. I would usually spend these weekends away staying with friends or family as my parents' house is a bit creepy to be alone in, even during the day. We live in a small rural town where everyone knows each other and generally it's pretty quiet and pretty safe. Saturday I was supposed to stay with a friend, but her parents decided at the last minute not to let me stay. It wasn't a big deal that I had to leave. I was somewhat prepared to have to go home because her parents got weird about company sometimes. I left her house, which is about 15 minutes away from my parents' house, at around 9.30 or 9.45. While I was on the way home, I got a weird feeling that I can't really explain. I just knew that I didn't want to go stay at my parents alone. I called my brother and asked if I could stay with him. At the time, he was living with a woman who had a small child. He told me it would be quieter and easier for him to just come stay with me, since his dog would bark if I tried to come in the house. He said he would be at our parents' house in 20 minutes. After hanging up, I decided to stop at a gas station and grab a snack before going home so that my brother would be there when I got there. I pulled into the gas station. There were only a few cars in the lot, which is typical because this is a small town in the rural south where everything pretty much stops after 8pm. I parked and walked up to the door. There was a man standing outside the door smoking. He opened the door for me without saying anything. This is normal southern hospitality. I smiled and thanked him. Inside there was another man standing by the door. I noticed him staring at me as soon as I came in. He gave me that gross up and down look and said something to the effect of, Hey, what are you doing alone? Creepy. I just ignored him and walked towards the back of the store. He yelled after me and called me a name. I still ignored him. I figured he was drunk or high or just a jerk. Most people around here talk a big game but rarely back it up. I wasn't scared, just annoyed. I got my snacks and paid at the counter. When I walked back up to the door, both of the men were gone. I was happy to not have to deal with any more catcalling. I began walking across the lot towards my car, which was probably around 100 feet away from my door. As I was walking, I looked down on my phone to see if enough time had passed for my brother to be at my parents. When I looked up, the guy who had hit on me was standing at the pump staring. I looked at him for a second and continued walking. Hey, you know you're supposed to answer a man when he speaks to you, he said. I remember saying something snarky back to him and getting in my car. He looked pissed at my sarcasm. I locked my doors as soon as I was in the car, started it, and was thinking of nothing but getting home to eat my snacks and hang out with my brother. I put my car in gear and realized the man had disappeared. I looked around before pulling out of my parking spot only to realize that both men were sitting in a car facing mine across the lot. They were both staring at me and talking, occasionally even pointing toward me. I just stared at them, defiant and pissed. I didn't want them to think they scared me at all. While we were sitting having our staring contest, the man who had opened the door for me smiled and gave me the finger across the throat gesture, as in, you're dead. I rolled my eyes and pulled out the gas station, annoyed. To my dismay, they pulled out behind me. I hadn't been scared up until this point because, as I said, most people here are a lot of talk with no follow through. Instead of going home, I took a few back roads that connect back in a sort of circle to see if they were really following me, which of course they were. When they realized I was testing them, they drove up really close to me and started laying on the horn. I couldn't see their headlights, they were so close. I called my brother and told him what was going on. He told me to come home and he would handle it. I started driving home. The two guys were still in my car blowing the horn. Even with my detours, I was only about 3-4 to four minutes from my parents' house. I slowed down to pull in the driveway and was immediately relieved. At the end of my driveway, my brother was standing hands crossed in front of his stomach, clearly holding a pistol. I drove around him into the yard. The two guys actually started to pull in behind me until they saw my brother, then they hightailed it out of there. I have no idea what they would have done if I had stopped somewhere alone or kept driving. I'm thankful my brother was there. This past New Year's Eve, I went away for the night with my two best friends and one of their moms. I was home for the holidays from college and my friend Sarah invited me to go to Palm Springs to celebrate New Year's with her mom and our friend Rachel. I didn't have any other plans so I decided to go with them. We went to a cool city about an hour from where we live that is big on shopping and resorts. We planned to have a pretty calm night, watch the ball drop at a block party thing downtown, have a few drinks at a bar. Since we're on the west coast, the ball drop is at 9, so at around 8, 
we ventured from our hotel, walking to the block party about a mile away. On the way, we passed by a very lively bar. We decided to stop by and spend 15 minutes dancing, but didn't get any drinks. We continued on to the block party, get some dinner, a glass of champagne. The ball dropped, and they had a DJ, so we spent about an hour there dancing. After we got tired of it, we decided to head back to the bar and hang out there until midnight. Once we get there, Sarah's mom pays for a drink for each of us, but leaves soon after that because she was tired. It's about 10.30 at this point, and Sarah, Rachel, and I are enjoying our drinks and having fun dancing. Rachel tried some of my drink, since it was the one she hadn't had before. I went back to the bar to get a second drink, and that's the last thing I remember. The rest I've gathered from Sarah and Rachel. Almost immediately after getting my second drink, I asked Rachel to go to the bathroom with me because I wasn't feeling well, even though I was completely fine 10 minutes before. Once in the bathroom, I just collapsed on the floor, and I was almost unresponsive. Rachel not worried, somehow drags my half-lifeless body out to where Sarah was waiting for us. Security, seeing my condition and assuming I was wasted, asked us to leave. Sarah and Rachel decided to take me back to the hotel about a half a mile away. By this point, I was unconscious and there were barely any sounds escaping from my mouth. They saw someone leave the bar at the same time as us, who was walking near us, but they were preoccupied with trying to keep my lifeless body off the ground. At one point, I threw up all over myself, the both of them, and the sidewalk, etc. The next part of the story we had to get from Sarah, and Rachel doesn't have any memory of this. Still struggling to carry me, the man they saw leave the bar approached them. He was hitting on Rachel, trying to get her to go grab a drink with him. She was very agitated and told him to leave. Her friend needed help right now. He didn't take no for an answer and continued to follow us down the street, asking if they wanted to get drinks with him, if he could help carry me and such. A middle-aged woman witnessing this came up and told the man off. Something along the lines of, stop harassing these young women or I'm going to call the police. He left after that. Next, by some miracle, an EMT and his wife enjoying the holiday ran into us on the street. He checked me out to make sure something wasn't majorly wrong and then carried me the rest of the way to my hotel and into the room, since my friends could barely hold me up. They thanked him profusely and him and his wife left. This is where Rachel's memory kicks back in. Five minutes later, they get a knock on the door, and it's the EMT and his wife again. They came to let us know that a man followed us to the hotel, and they just saw him pop the gate and start to make his way to our room. My friends called hotel security, but they were unable to find him. My friends didn't get a glimpse of him, but I'm sure it was the same man from earlier. I spent the rest of the night vomiting everything in my body, and dry heaving after that. I woke up the next morning in a pile of pillows and blankets on the bathroom floor. My last memory was at the bar getting a second drink, and my friends filled me in on everything that had happened. Feeling bad, I thought I must have drank way too much, but I had never blacked out before in my life, and the amount of drinks I had, two in two hours since I didn't get to drink my second at the bar, didn't add up to me being completely unconscious. We decided my first drink had to have been drugged, since Rachel had some of it and had no memory of our walk home, even though she was fully functional. I'm sure that man that was talking to Rachel and then followed us back was the one that slipped something in my drink. To this day, I don't really know how it could have been slipped something. I got my drink from the bar and never set it down. My best guess was that it was already in the cup. Thankfully, I had good friends and kind strangers protected me that night. This happened back when I was in 4th grade. It's always stuck out to me as odd, but when I became an adult, it dawned on me just how dangerous it was. I had been invited to a friend's birthday party, which was to be held at a popular pizza joint that had a bunch of arcade games and stuff. This pizza place was right next door to a small movie theater, and the movie Titanic just had come out, so there was a decent amount of people in this part of the shopping center. My mom had to run some errands to pick up one of my other brothers, so she dropped me off along the way. She said she was going to stay until others arrived for the party, but I knew she had a lot to do. The place was familiar to me and I knew my friends were either already inside or would be there shortly, so I just told her to drop me off and I went inside. My mom had also arranged a ride home for me from one of my friend's parents. No one had gotten there yet, so I had to look around at the different games and then went outside the restaurant to wait for my friends to show up. There were a bunch of people outside the theater lined up waiting to get inside for the early evening showing of Titanic. That's when I noticed that a couple, a guy and a girl, were standing by a car smoking cigarettes and looking over at me. A chunk of time had passed, probably like 20 minutes, and I was super confused why my friends hadn't showed up yet. I knew for a fact that I was at the right place and that I showed up at the right time. I was going over all the reasons why they might be late when the cigarette smoking couple came over to me and started talking to me. They asked me what or who I was waiting for. Obviously at first, I was hesitant to talk to strangers, but they looked to be my oldest brother's age, late teens, early 20s, so I had been around older people and wasn't too bashful or shy around them, conversationally. 
I explained to them I was waiting for my friends to show up for my birthday party, but they hadn't showed up yet, and they were all pretty late. The couple made some other small talk. They told me they were wanting to see Titanic, but when they showed up, all the tickets had sold off for the showing they wanted, so they were just going to hang out until the next showing, which they had successfully gotten tickets for. After a little while longer of waiting and talking with this couple, they asked if I was hungry. I said I was, and they offered to buy me pizza. As a hungry kid who was seriously looking forward to pizza, but was unsure if the party was still going to happen, I wasn't about to pass it up. We went inside and ordered and sat down. I ended up hanging out with this couple for a long time. They were being super nice to me, gave me money for the arcade games, bought me as much pizza and soda as I wanted. I had almost completely forgotten about my friends and the party that was supposed to happen, until I saw what time it was. Almost two hours had passed, and I started to get pretty nervous slash anxious. I wasn't sure how I was going to get home. I didn't have a cell phone, this was 1997, and neither did my parents. My mom would be furious that A, no one showed up to the party, and B, I didn't seek out help from the restaurant or some kind of security guard or police police officer, and see, I'd spend the two last hours with strangers, accepting food and money from them. I decided to ask this couple what I should do. This is where things started to get really strange. The guy turned to me and said flatly, you don't need to go home. Thinking back, I definitely couldn't fully comprehend the weight of what he said. I didn't know what to say, so I kind of shrugged in confusion and said I needed to find a phone. I went up to the counter and asked if I could use their phone, and they let me. I called home, but no one answered. I tried again, still nothing. I then told the people at the counter that I was trying to get picked up, but no one was answering the phone at home. I must have looked pretty panicked, because just then the guy from the couple came over and put his hand on my shoulder and said, don't worry, we'll get this figured out. He then gave me some more money to play a few more arcade games while he figured it out with the guys behind the counter. No idea what they talked about specifically, but I ended up playing another game and then went back to the table we were at. The guy came back over and said that they were going to take me home. He was being super positive and upbeat about it and was insisting that it was no problem whatsoever. His girlfriend was also being very insistent and supportive of the idea. Part of me was super hesitant because I was taught stranger danger and all that, but the other part of me was wanting to believe it was all really innocent and I was really grateful that these people had been so nice to me, fed me, and kept me entertained. They had even missed their movie to stay with me. I said that I wanted to try calling home a few more times. So over the next 15 to 20 minutes, I tried calling home a bunch but there was still no answer. I decided that I would say yes to these people and have them take me home. Again, I was young, impressionable, naive, etc. The people behind the counter must have been seeing this from the more rational side and realized something seriously fishy was going on. One of them had gone on break and called the police to come over and address the situation. Policeman shows up and comes over to figure out what's going on. I don't remember everything about the conversation, but what it ended up coming down to was who was going to take me home. The couple was still really insistent. Thinking about this as an adult, I find it strange that the cop was even considering letting this whole thing to be an option. As an adult, there is no question in my mind that the cop should have shut the conversation down and taken me home, but for some odd reason, they let me decide. I felt like I was being pressured. I remember going back and forth in my mind. These people had been so nice to me and had hung out with me and I didn't want to be rude, and I also felt really intimidated by the police officer. I remember this part as if it was yesterday. As I was thinking, the cop went over to talk to some of the guys behind the counter, and while he was away, the guy from the couple looked at me with a smile and asked, do you want to go with him or us? I told him I would go with them. Again, in hindsight, I still can't believe the cop let this happen. As we were getting our things to go, the officer did say that he was going to follow us the whole way, which was a redemptive assurance. The officer asked for my address and my parents' names. I got in the couple's car and told them where I lived and we were on our way. The girl was driving and the guy was in the front passenger seat. The entire drive, the guy was looking over his shoulder out the back window, glancing back and forth between me and the cop following behind us. We pulled up to my house and I went up to the front door while both the couple and the cop were parked on the street. Opened the door, went inside, and saw that my mom was looking out the window with a very confused and concerned look on her face. She went outside and found out all that had happened. It was furious. I didn't tell her the specific things that the couple had said to me. Again, I didn't understand the full gravity of the whole situation until years later. Going through the whole scenario in my head, if the cop hadn't followed us, I more than likely would have been abducted. Thinking about all the things that they had said and done, befriending me and feeding me and giving me money to play games, was them totally trying to come across as disarming and trusting and friendly. A totally screwed up situation that could have been so much worse. Hard to think about. I'm almost 30 now and have kids of my own and thinking about them in this kind of situation makes my blood boil. At about 8pm last night I was walking with a friend of mine, Sally, about a mile to the closest cafe. We're both girls in our early 20s, neither of us own cars, and Sally didn't have her Opal card, which is an automatic ticketing system for public transport. So walking was our only option. It's summer over here, so it was still fairly well lit, and we were walking down main roads, so we weren't too concerned. 
We finally arrive at this cafe and sit down. I was paying but I only had my credit card and sure enough, it was cash only. Sally was on the phone when I got back from the counter, so I just gestured for her to stay put and guard the spot while I went to go get cash. This is my home suburb so I know there's no ATMs around and my best bet is a gas station about a block away. I'm doing a light jog so I don't keep Sally waiting and when a balding, sweating guy probably in his late 40s with a tank top and no shoes come pacing behind me as I pass the corner of the block. He walks behind me for about 100 meters. I didn't really think much of it. The gas station was the next building along. It seemed like he had just come out of a nice suburban house along the street and it wasn't the witching hour so I just assumed he was going to the station like me. He didn't even cross my mind as I entered the tiny convenience store, nor did he follow me in. In my peripheral, I saw him walk past the door and out of sight. I looked around for an ATM they sometimes have inside. No such luck, so I go up to this man in his 30s at the desk and reluctantly ask if they're able to do cash out. He smiles and says, of course, and then asks, is he with you? I have no idea who he's talking about at first, and then he points to the man from earlier, pacing around outside the store. Keep in mind, he didn't look at all menacing. He wasn't going back and forth just outside the door. He was drifting in the space outside, from the pavement to the gas pumps to the storefront seemingly aimlessly. I assumed he was on drugs. I tell the clerk no, not thinking much of it at all. He says, oh, he was staring at you before. I thought he might have been your dad. I laugh it off. I honestly wasn't concerned at all. He was still ambling around outside and I couldn't imagine him having a fixed gaze on anything. I thank the clerk for the cash, but before I turn away to leave, he says, just wait and see if he leaves first. We wait for a few minutes in silence and the guy begins to pace back and forth directly against the front wall of the store, looking straight ahead and never into the store. It still looked like the man was just on a drug-induced amble and seemed harmless. Not once did I catch his gaze, so I figured it would be safe to just slip out the door and walk back to the cafe in the fairly bright light of dusk, especially since Sally was texting me at this point asking, where are you? I thank the guy at the desk once again for his concern and assure him that I don't know the guy and I'm not involved in some weird scheme to rob the store and head for the door. The clerk asks if I want him to walk out with me, I say that it should be alright, and begin walking away from the block. As I leave the store, the drifting man stops pacing and makes a beeline for me from the other end of the building. I seriously didn't think much of the guy at all until this point but for the first time he was briskly walking in a straight line towards me. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I start power walking so that he doesn't think I'm actively trying to escape him, still trying to convince myself that I'm just being paranoid and should be more casual. I don't look behind me to see how close he is. I've reached the pavement on the other side of the gas pumps when I heard the clerk run outside. He's yelling at me, go, run, run. I make a break for it, looking over my shoulder. He's grabbed the man by his shoulders from behind. The baldy man isn't even glancing behind him or trying to escape. He's just watching me run away. I keep running until I've crossed the road and then turn around, standing still. The clerk is still holding onto the odd, staring man. The clerk and I are just looking at each other in bewilderment, not really knowing what to do. He makes a hand gesture to go and I gesture my hands thanks, you know, the clasp your hands together and shake them a bunch of times. I got back to Sally with the cash and bought food before walking back home a different way. Overall, odd guy at the gas station, let's not me. Nice gas station attendant who went well out of his way to help my naive self, I'm definitely glad we met. I was selling my old car as I had bought a new one. I posted it on a couple of selling sites and Facebook. I arranged two visits that day and was home alone. It was broad daylight so I assumed everything would be fine. The first one that came made an offer a little lower than what I was looking for so I said I would get back to him later as I had another viewing. The guy from Facebook pulled up in a blacked out Range Rover and three other guys got out. I opened the car and explained why I was selling the car. You know when you just get a bad feeling? I wasn't sure why four people would need to come view an eight year old car. He asked if he could take the car for a drive. At this point, I was not going to get in the car with him so I said, yeah, take it, I'll wait here with your friends. He asked me to get in the car. What if he just took it? I said, well, it wouldn't matter. That's what insurance was for. I was not getting in the car with them. The three guys left and didn't even speak to me, just to themselves, and I found that odd, but it made me feel very unsure if the car would come back. The car was not putting up a fight for or arguing over. He then pulled back up. He got out and offered the same price as the other guys earlier buying the car for his daughter. He wanted me to get in the car with him to go collect the cash. I said it was fine, his friends could take him if he needed to go, but I had another viewing and I would contact him later. I didn't want to walk back to my house as I had now decided to sell to the other guy as they were just giving me the creeps. He then offered more than honestly the car was worth if I went with him now. I said no and locked the car and started walking towards the main street as I had seen my neighbor walking down and shouted to him and his dog. They spoke to each other and drove off. 
I text the other guy and told him the car was his and he was welcome to come over anytime to get it. I sorted and filled out the V5 and off he went. That night from my living room the Black Range Rover came back and parked outside. I live in a cul-de-sac so I am set back to where we had been. I told my husband and he looked out and he said that was strange and then my phone started blowing up. I politely said the car had gone and that I was sorry but I couldn't help. The car drove off and came back again 30 minutes later. This happened about 3 times that night and was a bit strange but thought nothing more of it as the next few days nothing happened. On the Friday 4 days later I finish work early and get back and get the dog ready to go out. We were going to head straight to the park and run like the wind. As I got to the end of the cul-de-sac the same car pulled up and one of the guys jumped out and said hello. I held the lead tighter and my dog was thoroughly unimpressed. She gave a bit of a grumble and he asked if he could pet her. I said no she is a guard dog and doesn't like to be touched and went to walk up to me. He then grabbed my arm and the dog latched into his forearm. Q was screaming there was only one other guy with him in the car and he jumped out and started to shout. This is the most placid and loving dog you will ever see and to be honest it was a warning nip as if she had meant to really hurt him she would have gone through the bone. His friend was shouting and pulling him away. I called her back and got her to sit with a few neighbors and came out when they went towards their car. I haven't seen their car since but honestly I wouldn't sell something that meant someone had to come to my home online again. So a stranger who clearly wasn't interested in the car, let's never meet again. When I was 11, we, my single mom, 9 year old sister, and 6 year old brother moved into a beautiful, older, craftsman style house. I heard it was around 80 years old back then in 1994. Soon after we moved in, we found out it was infested with cockroaches. I never seen anything like it. You turn on the lights at night and they'd scatter from every surface. We had to store all of our food that wasn't canned in the fridge so they wouldn't get into it. We tried bug bombs and professional exterminators numerous times with no effect. Those things really can survive a nuclear war. Anyway, they weren't the reason we lived in the house less than a year before fleeing for our lives. I remember my mom discussing at our next door neighbor's creepy son with my grandma. He was in his 20s or 30s. She'd been doing dishes one day and looked up to see him standing directly on the other side of the kitchen window, staring in at her. Normally, she would have kept something scary like this from us kids, but about at that time, she told us to tell her if we ever saw him near the house and we weren't allowed to play outside. So one afternoon we were all doing some spring cleaning when my brother said he found a cigarette butt in the upstairs toilet. Weird, since nobody in our family smokes. Being a dumb little six year old, he flushed it before telling our mom. I still remember her trying to get the entire story out of him, being upset that the evidence was gone, and thinking he might have been mistaken or maybe he'd picked up a butt somewhere outside of curiosity. She soon dropped it and we mostly forgot about it. I think it was a few weeks later. My brother was spending the night at our grandparents and my sister and I were the only ones upstairs. Our mom's bedroom was downstairs. My sister heard a sound like a screen door slamming, but she insisted it came from in the house and she was freaked out. I told her it was just from outside and to go to sleep. A minute later, we heard a strangled cough coming from just outside our bedroom door, a man's cough, and sounded like he was trying to keep from making noise. I whispered that we needed to get downstairs. We sneaked out of the room and I had the irrational urge to turn on the light in the bathroom, which was just across the hall from our bedroom, and check to see if anyone was there. Then just as strong of a feeling to get away from the bathroom and get downstairs now. The scariest moment of my life was when we were creeping down the stairs in the pitch black. It was a spiral enclosed stairway with walls, the perfect place for someone to hide. The stairway light was burned out and the wood steps were creaky, so it was terrifying making our way down. We got downstairs and woke up our mom, panicked that there was a guy upstairs in our bathroom. She started to tell us to go back to bed, but could see we were seriously scared. She went over to the bottom of the stairway to go up and shows that there was nothing to be scared about. Then she just has strong of a feeling to close the stairway door and lock it now. She did, called the cops, they found nothing and didn't really take us seriously. The next day, she called a PD detective friend of hers from high school to come over and inspect the house. Remembering the cigarette butt in the toilet, she had him look at the upstairs bathroom window. It was a high, narrow rectangular window. Not very big, but just wide enough for a person. Who knows how many times the intruder climbed our roof to get in and was upstairs while we were sleeping across the hall. The window swung up on hinges. When my mom's friend let the window drop, it sounded like a screen door slamming. He said the locks on all the windows were so old they were practically useless, and we needed to get out of the house immediately. We moved into my grandparents' house that day. When my mom went with her brothers a few days later to pack up some things, a back door had been smashed open, but nothing in the house was disturbed. A few years later, we heard the neighbor's son was arrested for attempted murder. I still wonder what might have happened if I turned on that bathroom light, if my mom didn't lock the stairway door, or if we didn't leave the house when we did. Backstory, my wife and I don't live together. She had become abusive over the last few months, mostly towards our daughter. Our daughter is almost 18 months old and is my whole world. I am unemployed at the moment, but my mother had been helping me out a lot. 
Today at around 4 p.m., I took my daughter to the store. I usually do this around the time she wakes up from her nap. My daughter is a very active child and can't seem to sit still for more than 10 minutes without getting cranky. I usually let her walk with me, holding her hand and patiently walking at her pace. I usually get just a juice for her, but had to get some extra groceries that I was short on. Flour, sugar, and some noodles. I also remembered we were low on milk and grabbed a gallon on our way back. With all that I was carrying, I wasn't able to hold her hand. I made sure to walk behind her, but that only makes her walk slowly. As we made our way to the registers, I was continuously urging her to keep walking, which she would do, but only for a second before her attention would be drawn to another rickety box with whatever was on sale, or she would see something colorful on a lower shelf. I was getting a bit frustrated, but I wasn't showing it in my voice. I kept urging her to keep walking, and she kept getting sidetracked. With everything I was carrying, I started to wish I had grabbed a basket. At the front, their customer service desk holds register 1, which was thankfully open. I want to take the time to mention that my daughter is very fond of saying hi and waving at everyone. I set everything up to get rung up, but the service attendant was busy with the return of the customer service area, so I had to wait. The entrance to the store is to my right, the only exit door is behind the service desk, which leads into the small foyer before leading to the other doors. As people enter, they have to pass the customer service desk. I was being fatherly to my daughter, trying to entertain her with patty cake and the itsy bitsy spider, while we waited for the cashier to check us out. My daughter would frequently wave at people passing and say hi in her squeaky toddler voice. Some people would smile and wave back, while others would stop to adore her. At this point, I'm used to people doing that. The lady was ready to check us out, and I told my daughter to hold my hand, since I wouldn't be looking her way. I had to pull my wallet out to retrieve my debit card to pay for the groceries and let her hand go for a moment. I kept looking her way to make sure she wasn't wandering off. The lady went to hand me my receipt when she all of a sudden yelled at someone behind me. What are you doing with this daughter? She bellowed as I turned to look at a man who had picked her up and started running towards the entrance doors. I was shocked. The doors didn't open since they were a one-way set of doors, and the cashier quickly picked up the phone yelling that she was calling the police. I was stunned to the point of immobilization, but quickly realized what was going on. I have a pocket knife that I usually carry on me so I can break the seal on my daughter's juice. I quickly ran after the man as someone started to make their way through the entrance doors. He didn't get a chance to run through though because I slammed my fist across his temple. I decided to not use the knife in case I might get in trouble. The man stumbled and I grabbed my daughter from his arms. He then proceeded to run out the door empty handed. The police arrived about 5 minutes later and asked me what I had seen. I explained that I hadn't seen the man's face since he had long hair and a beard. He was also wearing a hoodie, which wasn't that much of a surprise. They took the statement of several witnesses, including the cashiers, and had already had other officers searching the area. Someone had said the guy had ran behind the building, but the officers didn't find anyone. The police took us home and then asked more questions like, have you seen him before? Do you know anyone who looks like this man? And they proceeded to ask about the home life. CPS had been over earlier in the day to discuss my wife's mental health plan, and the police had been here earlier as well. The officers asked if we needed any groceries or anything. I told them no. The officers left, leaving me their cards in case I saw the guy around the area. About 20 minutes later, I got a knock at the door. To my surprise, the officers had returned with the largest box of Pampers diapers I had ever seen. A large box of wipes, about 6 large Winko bags of groceries, and a couple bag of toys. They had left us with a Christmas card saying I was a strong father to have had so much go on recently and that my daughter was lucky to have such a great father. There was a $100 bill in the car too, wrapped in a note that said to get a drink or two if I needed it. I don't drink so I'll probably get some extra Christmas presents for my mom and daughter. So, to the guy that tried to kidnap my daughter, I hope the police find you. Close to 10 years ago, my best friend and I scored the deal of the century. Living her parents recently purchased and refurbished home for cheap as Chip's rent so the property wasn't considered unoccupied and their insurance still covers it. They were planning on selling their house in the country and moving closer to town in a year. But when they spotted this place, it was perfect, so they snapped it up. They couldn't be bothered dealing with random tenants for a year, so we offered it. It was a lovely old mid-Victorian-style house with a hallway running the majority of the link on the left side, and three bedrooms and a bathroom coming off the hallway to the right. At the back of the house was an open-plan living room and kitchen in a backyard. It was an inner Melbourneian suburb, so it was totally fenced in with six-foot fence on three sides, and the front had a cutesy white picket fence. On the right side of the property, an outdoor gravel pathway was wedged beside the bedroom walls and the fence line. It began with a gate in the front yard and ran the length of the property to the backyard. This is important later. My friend obviously scored the master bedroom at the front, with lovely vertically opening bay windows facing the front garden and street. I had the next bedroom, with the window facing the gravel path slash fence, and the third bedroom was our study. We lived here for close to 10 months in bliss, great house, great company, and even though the area was considered a little dicey, the location was stellar. One hot summer night, we said our goodnights, and I went to bed and fell asleep immediately. 
My housemate stayed up in bed to read for a bit, with just her bedside light on. She was doing that just for an over an hour before she heard a weird scratch in the front window of her bedroom. Initially, she put it down to an overhanging tree branch, till she realized there was no overhanging tree branch. She sat frozen in fear, blankly staring at her book for what felt like an eternity, till she heard the noise again and again, scratch, scratch. Slowly looking up, she saw a dude wearing a hoodie trying to open her window, looking her dead in the eyes. She screamed, jumped out of bed, and ran straight into my room. I woke up super dazed as she was pulling my hand and whispered yelling that someone was trying to break in. She had a tendency to be a little overdramatic sometimes, but I swear I've never seen someone look so genuinely terrified. I went to grab my phone to call the cops, but we just went completely still when we heard the distinct crunch 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 of someone walking down the side path of the house. We both rolled off my bed onto the floor and went completely still. The crunch 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 continued, getting closer to my bedroom window. I don't know what it is about distinct sounds at night when it's otherwise quiet but it sounded deafening. And then I realized why it was so loud. My window was wide open. I jumped up, slid the window down and slammed the lock shut just as he reached the window. He looked at me but he didn't react at all. He just calmly tried to open the window but when he realized he couldn't, he continued down the pathway to the backyard. I was extremely terrified now and my housemate was crying. I sprinted to the back door to thankfully find it locked and ran back to my room and called the cops. I didn't know what the cops knew that we didn't but they must have broken a land speed record to arrive all at 3 minutes later, lights and sirens off. We saw them go down the side path, guns drawn, straight to the backyard. There were some noises from the yard, then a knock at the back door a moment later and the police identified themselves. Turns out the dude had vaulted the back fence, and another patrol car was headed to the next street over to look for him. The two cops at our place asked if we were okay and then asked if they could come in and look around. They managed to calm us down whilst making sure the place was safe. They took her statements and they asked if there was anyone we could stay with tonight. My housemate and I stayed at our boyfriend's place for a few nights after that, and when we stayed in the house, it was never the same. We felt completely violated, and ended up moving out a few weeks later. We never found out if the dude was caught, but there was a random stabbing a few nights after the incident at the train station two streets over. If it was related or not, I don't know, but all I can think is that we were so lucky that it went the way it did. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This happened way back in October of 2006. At the time I was just a 19 year old kid always on the lookout for adventure. One Friday night after wrapping up a shift at McDonald's, I met up with some of my friends who suggested we check out this haunted location called White's Bridge. My one buddy Brandon said he had recently learned about it and began telling us the legends associated with the 100 year old wood covered bridge. Never want to turn down a spooky experience, we all piled into my green Ford Taurus and headed out on our journey. Brandon gave directions, guiding me off the main road and within minutes we were on the dirt back roads, surrounded by woods and cornfields. Our only point of reference was a blinking cell tower off in the distance. We could tell we were getting further from the city as our cell phones began slowly losing service. As we rode deeper and deeper into what legitimately felt like the absolute middle of nowhere, Brandon repeated the legend associated with the bridge. Back in the early 1900s, a local farmer discovered that his beloved wife had been cheating on him, and in a fit of rage he killed her and her lover after discovering them in the act. After committing the cold-blooded murder, the farmer left his home and wandered the dirt roads into days. He eventually came upon White's Bridge where the realization of what he had done finally began to sink in, and deciding he would rather die than face the consequences of his actions, he hoisted a rope up and over one of the bridge's rafters and hung himself. As far as I could tell now, the story is complete fiction, but we totally believed it at the time. After a long and bumpy ride, Brandon instructed me to turn right on an off-road I wouldn't have even noticed was there had he not pointed it out. I took the turn and there before us was White's Bridge. It looked like something straight out of a horror film, an old wood covered bridge, aged by time, sitting alone above a river deep in the middle of nowhere. We parked the car on the side of the road and got out to explore. Immediately catching our eyes was a scarecrow line abandoned at the entrance to the bridge. My friend Mike, who was known as somewhat of a risk taker, and a stupid one at that, picked up the scarecrow and lit it on fire. The hay body burst up into a ball of flames and Mike waved it around proudly next to the old dry wood bridge. Realizing the risk, I told him to throw the thing in the river and put it out, which thankfully he did. After making sure there weren't any rogue embers that could ignite the bridge, Brandon suggested we get back in the car and pull it onto the bridge. He explained that the legend was that if you parked your car in the middle of the bridge, put it in neutral and killed the engine, the spirit of the dead farmer would push the vehicle forward to get it off the bridge. Naturally, we had to try this. We piled back in and did exactly as he said. We parked halfway across the rickety old bridge and killed the engine. We sat in the pitch black, saying nothing, waiting for something, anything to happen. The only sounds were the creaking of the bridge, the river flowing beneath us, and footsteps? 
Suddenly, the back driver's side door opens and a woman abruptly enters the back seat, cramming in next to my two friends back there. She looked to be in her late 20s slash early 30s, long straight black hair, slim, and wearing a plaid shirt and blue jeans. It's been a while but this is essentially how I remember the conversation going. I saw your fire signal for me, she said. Uh, wait, what? I replied, totally freaked out and at a complete loss of words. I'm so glad you came. My boyfriend's car broke down down that way. I need a ride back. My brain was doing its best to compute the situation. I'm sorry, but who are you? I asked. What are you doing out here? I told you. She responded curtly. My boyfriend's car broke down over there. Can you please just give me a ride so I don't have to walk all the way back? She was pointing ahead, towards a narrow road that forked off to the right on the other side of the bridge. My friend Mike, the scarecrow burner, and ever the gentleman added, I mean, if you need a place to stay, you're more than welcome to come crash in my place. I got plenty to drink and I interrupted him. No, lady, listen, I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. You just got in my car and this is all really weird. I'm sorry, but you have to get out. She glared at me in the rearview mirror. If if looks could kill, I would have been done for, but you signaled for me. She responded in an irritated tone. We weren't signaling for you, get out. She let out an angry sigh and got out, walking back in the direction from which she came and disappearing into the night. I started the engine right up and looked at my friends. They all had looks of disbelief on their face. Without saying a word, I put the car in drive and slowly rolled forward and off the bridge. We needed to turn around and go back across the bridge to get to where we had come from, and the only way to do that was to pull onto the side road that the woman said her boyfriend's car had broken down on, and then reverse. As I pulled onto the side road, my headlights illuminated the three posted signs that I hadn't been able to see from the bridge. No trespassing, private property, and do not enter. Looking up the road, there was no sign of the woman. Wherever she went, it didn't appear she went that way. I didn't want to stick around though, so I backed up and crossed the bridge again, and from there began the journey home. We didn't have much to say on the ride home, I think we were all equally stunned. Except for Mike, who asked if he knew anyone that would be awake at the salver that he could score some weed from. I visited White's Bridge a couple other times after that, but nothing of no happened in my subsequent visits. Sadly, some people burned down the old White's Bridge some years ago. It was rebuilt, but from what I hear, it's just not the same as the original. I don't have any plans to go and check it out. To the strange lady who entered my car out in the middle of nowhere at 2am, let's not meet. This happened in 2019. I was in my second year of college and living in a town home about a 10 minute walk from campus. I lived with two other girls at the time, but they were all back at their parents' house for the holiday. I work in healthcare and was working Christmas this year. A little bit of backstory, there used to be four of us living there but one girl had moved out due to issues with her boyfriend. He was a jerk who abused our kindness and allowing him to stay there, was only supposed to come every so often but basically ended up living there. We told her she needed to kick him out after an incident with him one night after he got physical with her and verbally abusive with the rest of us. She wouldn't listen and we told her we would have to talk to the landlord then. Long story short, she ended up moving out and left on bad terms with us. At this point, it was affecting everyone and we didn't feel safe with him there, etc., so she moved out. Okay, so back to the story. It was Christmas Eve and I worked the next day, so I was getting ready for bed. Locked the doors, turned the lights off, and went downstairs where my bedroom is. I was scrolling on my phone for about an hour. It was Christmas Day at this point, when I heard what sounded like the chairs in the kitchen move. The kitchen is right above my bedroom. I thought maybe I was hearing the neighbors next door as we share the same walls and sometimes they can be loud, but I remembered one of them texting me and asking me to bring in a package they were expecting while they were all gone at home. The noise was short-lived, so I brushed it off. Next thing I know, my bedroom door is being opened slowly, but my phone screen is lighting up my scared jaw drop face, so I can't act like I'm asleep. Where I'm laying in bed faces directly to the door, so we're just looking right at each other. So there I was laying in my bed while this guy has one foot in my bedroom with the door cracked open. It felt like an eternity, but in reality it was probably more than like 10 seconds of us looking at one another. He slowly takes his foot out and closes my door. I sit there just in complete utter shock. I couldn't make out what he looked like as my eyes were adjusting to the dark again from the phone screen. All I could see was a backwards baseball cap. I knew I had to call the police, but my anxious self knew if I called, it would alert my parents' phones that I called. Me being dumb, I was like, well, I don't want to make them worry. Also, I was scared he might still be somewhere in the house, and I didn't know what he would do if he heard me call. So I text the guy I was seeing at the time and tell him, some random guy just broke into my house and came into my room. He snapped me out of it and told me to call the police, and so I did. The dispatcher asked me if I felt comfortable to go unlock the front door for them so they didn't have to break it down, and I told her no way I don't care if the door is broken, I'm not going up there alone. 
A couple minutes later, I see flashlights shining through my window. I hear the police knocking at the door and announcing themselves. They got in and asked me where I was. I came out of my room and they came and got me. They told me to wait on the back porch while two of them searched the house and one stayed with me. They didn't find anyone and I said nothing looked like it had been taken. They even tried to get fingerprints but were unsuccessful. They then started asking me questions and informed me that the back door was unlocked and had no signs it had been broken. I told them I had locked it. Luckily, the guy I was talking to stayed with me that night but I still couldn't sleep. I kept having to go check every inch of the house over and over. I placed chairs under the door handles on the front door, back door, and my bedroom. The next day, I informed our landlord and she refused to come out and change the locks, and she never ended up changing them for the rest of the time we lived there. Every time I go to bed now, I triple check all the doors have been locked, doesn't matter where I am. I have a dog now and he helps my anxiety of intruders, as well as a recent purchase of a ring doorbell. I believe it was our old roommate's boyfriend. I think they may have made an extra key for him because he was basically living there, but I don't understand why he didn't do anything to me, the house, or our belongings. If it were someone random, I don't know why they wouldn't have done what they intended Intended and that could be many different possibilities. I don't know what their intentions were that night, but to the man who broke into my house on Christmas Eve, let's not meet again. Over the summer, me, my fiance, and my stepdaughter, then two years old, went on a vacation to Presque Isle in Pennsylvania. We stayed there throughout the afternoon and decided to get dinner in a nearby town, Erie, Pennsylvania. We go there and see a water fountain that kids play in. We think our kid would like that, so we get food and take her there. Now, it was kind of a pretty sketchy area, but there were also kids and it was still a little light out, like 6.30, 7pm-ish. Me and my fiance sit down and watch our kid play for a bit. At some points, our kid wants me to run in the water with her so I do. I kind of keep going back and forth between playing with her and keeping my fiance company. After playing with my kid for a while, I come back to my fiance. She looked kind of pale and said, go get our kid. We need to leave right now. I didn't know what was going on, but I got my kid. As I was turning to go back and get her, I noticed a group of about three really weird guys staring intently at us. When I looked over, one of them stood up a little bit and was giving me a stare. I grab up her kid and start following my fiance who was booking it. As we were walking away, she tells me that somebody is following us now. I look over and see the creepy looking, a shirtless dude getting into his old beige sedan behind us. My fiance explains to me that the same man kept approaching her whenever I would get up to run around with her kid. At first he introduced himself and tried talking to her. She thought he was being benign but just trying to hit on her. When I came back he apparently bolted. I sat with her for a couple of minutes and then went back to play with her kid. Apparently as soon as I went he returned. He asked her if she was married to me. She said that we were going to be hoping that it was the end of that. He goes away before I came back to sit with her again. The third and final time I go to play with her kid he apparently came back. He told her that she thought she was a beautiful lady and asked if that was her daughter pointing to our kid. My fiance said yes and the guy said that our kid was also a beautiful lady and that his night was going to be made, whatever that means. Q and I come in and we book it. We're walking back to our car which is kind of far away. Erie in general was pretty abandoned outside of the park and we noticed the car pull out and start driving extremely slowly in a street parallel to us. At this point, I don't think he knew we saw him. My fiance is freaking out and I tell her to wait near the vestibule of a closed Starbucks where we weren't in this guy's vision. We stayed there for about 5 minutes and I was watching the roads, not seeing anything. We continue walking but are still on high alert. I found my car parked outside of a McDonald's and we're now power walking to it holding our kid. I look behind and lo and behold the same beige car going at 3 miles per hour just barely inches out from the side street so I can see it. As my fiance and the kid are getting in, I turn around and stand at the back of the car and shoot this guy the death stare. After looking at his car for about 10 seconds solid, he peels out and speeds off past us nearly hitting me. Not sure what this guy's problem was. I assume that he wasn't tailing us for any good reason. Afterwards, I bring up the three guys that were staring at me. My fiance said that the pervert following us was sitting with them when he wasn't coming over to her and saying creepy stuff. During college, I dated a fairly well-known and talented local musician named Tim. In the beginning, he was a loving, attentive, charismatic, seemingly normal partner. He made me mixtapes, cooked me my favorite meals, and dedicated songs to me at open mics around town. However, over the course of our year-long relationship, his mental health severely declined. He had the ability to appear lucid and normal around other people, but in private he began suffering delusions, compulsively lying, and creating art that focused on themes of murder. I was worried sick and his condition was exhausting, but I did my best to be kind, understanding, and supportive. I loved him and believed that he shouldn't have to struggle with this mental illness alone. One time he vanished without a trace for a full day. I found his apartment empty, lights on, front door wide open, phone on his nightstand. 
I took a few deep breaths and called all around the city for hours before finally discovering he had been involuntarily checked into a mental hospital. I did my best to be strong for him, seeing him every day during supervised visitation hour, bringing him his favorite books to pass the time, and holding him as he sobbed that it was all a mistake, that he did not belong there. It was surreal to see my boyfriend surrounded by visibly insane long-term psych ward patients. In retrospect, none of the staff ever told me the real reason why he was there, and I was too polite and naive to ask. Our relationship ended a few months later. I found undeniable evidence that he was cheating on me and, secretly relieved, confronted him. I told him to leave my apartment and never come back. He cracked. The gentle Tim I had known and loved melted away to reveal a new dark persona. He threatened to off himself with pills unless I took him back, but I was so extremely done that I called the police. They weren't much help, but Tim left. I blocked him everywhere and never contacted him again, but he left me insane voicemails from different numbers for weeks afterwards. I was relatively unshaken and things returned to normalcy. I graduated and got a sweet job in the same cool college city. Six months later, I woke up to concerned texts from mutual friends saying that they didn't want to freak me out, but Tim was off his meds, clearly manic, and was posting a newly written song all over his social media. His best friend, who hadn't been in touch since before the breakup, sent me an apology along with a screenshot of the lyrics. That got my attention. The song was pretty explicitly about my murder, but in a sort of clever, disguised way. I checked his profiles myself from a friend's account, and he was posting dozens and dozens of totally insane rambling statuses, most of them about me. They flip-flopped between flowerly love prose and murder imagery. His friends were reacting with concern, but a few egged him on, probably thinking he was just venting about his ex. I decided it'd be best to continue ignoring him, but I saved screenshots just in case. A few days later, while at work, I looked up from my computer to see Tim enter into the far side of the studio. My blood Blood turned to ice. He was talking to my creative director. It looked cordial enough, and I saw Tim begin to casually scan the studio. I dug down and bolted it to my favorite project manager's office, slammed the door, and unleashed upon her what it must have been a nearly unintelligible explanation of what was happening. I was shaking so hard I could barely speak, but Nancy was amazing, and she understood almost immediately. She snuck me out of the building and drove me in her car to the police station, where I showed officers the screenshots and filed a report. My co-workers later told me that Tim was there to inquire about the open designer position. He is not a designer. He had brought with him a portfolio and an elaborately fabricated work history that sounded legit. At the end of his interview, he casually asked if I still worked there. He said we used to collaborate. Oh, and he had written a song for me, and it had been picked up by the local radio this morning. He asked my co-workers to let me know with warmest regards. That phrase still makes my skin crawl. He then left, found my abandoned car in the parking lot, and paced behind it until the police arrived. Unfortunately, he wasn't enough of a public menace for police to bring him in that day, but the incident helped me to secure a restraining order against him. My company was amazing too. I was deeply embarrassed about my literally insane ex coming to the studio, but the CEO filed trespassing charges against him and created an action plan to keep me safe if it happened again. Not long afterwards, I moved to a different city, and that was that. Haven't heard from him since, but I discovered the most alarming part later. His roommate at the time, Liz, went through a similar experience with him during his breakdown, and when he compared notes much later she said she had seen a large axe in Tim's car the same week it had all gone down. She said that she was worried about Tim's Facebook activity so she removed the axe and hid it. Tim was so angry that he completely trashed their house and never came back. And if our timelines are correct, that must have been just before he came into my workplace for his interview. When I was about 12, I decided making a newspaper for my entire neighborhood was a really great idea. My friend and I were both at middle school and decided to get together once a month and write absolutely enthralling articles about the weather or when the pool would be open and then deliver our front slash back one page newsletter to every single house in our two street neighborhood whether they wanted it or not. We kept this up for about two years until the time of the story. So we were on our once a month paper route, if you could call, walking around our small neighborhood and putting a single sheet of paper in every mailbox of paper route. It was raining this particular time, so we had umbrellas and we were carefully walking to each mailbox, trying to keep our newsletter as dry as possible. This also meant all the cars that came by had their headlights and windshield wipers on, and also made sufficient noise with their tires splashing through the puddles. My point is that we knew when a car was approaching behind us. We were about halfway through on the street we weren't so familiar with, the one we didn't live on, when we noticed this souped up old white car coming really slowly up the street. Now, the way my neighborhood was set up, the only reason why you would be on the same street as us is if you lived there or you made a wrong turn. So there were even less cars on the street and the ones that passed usually were people that we knew. We continued walking from mailbox to mailbox while periodically checking to make sure the white car wasn't just parked. It was moving very slowly and the headlights and windshield wipers were either broken or just not turned on. This car drove slowly past us as we walked, going roughly the same pace as our steps if not slower. Something was so off about everything. There was no reason for this car to be on this road in the first place. 
We definitely didn't recognize it or the driver inside, and it was going so incredibly slow. Car trouble, I don't know. We pretended one of the houses was ours and walked up the driveway to avoid the car as it got close to us. It continued at the same pace and we watched it until it eventually disappeared around the corner. We laughed about it, thinking it was weird but nothing happened. It was all well and good until the car showed up at the end of the street behind us again, going just as slowly as it had before. What was this person doing? We were so confused and walked a little farther from the curb to avoid the car again as it came by. We didn't laugh about it this time. The car showed up a third time at the end of the street, and at this point we decided we should cut through some yards to get home. Better safe than sorry, right? We crossed the street, but the car passed again and we shrugged it off and kept going. The fourth time this car came around, it pulled up right next to us and the driver had his window down. Being 12 and living in a bubble, my friend and I hadn't really experienced shady people, but we knew something was up with this guy. He had a white towel draped over half his head, was wearing a white tank top, while we were in long sleeves and rain jackets, had his window down, and when he spoke his speech was slurred. We were polite and said hello and he asked us what we were doing through his open window. We continued walking as this interaction took place because we knew this dude seemed sketch, but at the same time we didn't want to assume anything and be rude. When we told him we ran a newspaper he immediately perked up and enthusiastically asked us about placing an ad. He also took his hands off the steering wheel and leaned over so he could get closer to the window. He smelled of cigarettes. My friend and I looked at each other, we knew something was wrong. We told him no, we don't place ads in our newspaper, even though we did. He told us we were pretty girls and probably cold. Our idea to cut through some yards was decided. We heard at least said something about needing to go home and he began shouting at us from inside the car as we crossed the street. We bolted to a neighbor's backyard when we heard the car begin to move quickly and hid in some bushes until we were sure the car was gone. We stopped writing our newsletter after that. Meeting a creepy person while you're alone in the rain in your own neighborhood was a good deciding factor for calling it quits. So, weird and probably high dude that tried to talk to a 12 year old me and my friend, let's never meet again. To start off, I am a 16 year old female. Okay, I was visiting my mom's apartment for the weekend with my sister. We go there every weekend or every other weekend to see her. We arrived at about 10 in the morning and brought in our pillows and movies or whatever from my grandma's car. We get inside and chill there for a couple hours, watching TV, before my sister says that she's hungry. My mom asked, okay, what do you want? I said I was okay with having a pizza, and my mom said that she would have to run to Kroger's, which is less than a mile away. She said she would also get some movies from Redbox. My sister then asked if she could go with my mom to Kroger's. My mom said she could and asked if I would be okay in the apartment by myself. I said I would because I knew I would. I'll be gone in 20 minutes tops, my mom said. She didn't like leaving me alone, but she thought it would be okay as she told me later. Now, my mom's apartment is kind of in a crappy place, where people have been spotted with drugs and thieves and stuff. But I was on the third floor in one of the many surrounding apartment buildings, with tons of neighbors. I would be fine. Okay, lock the door, and you know not to open unless it's me. They left soon after and I was sitting in the couch, on my phone with Jerry Springer playing in the background. It was about 10 minutes after they left when I heard the doorknob jiggle. I looked up, not feeling scared right away, but also feeling a little wary. I should mention that I carry a pocket knife everywhere with me and the blade is about 3-4 to four inches long. It was sitting on the coffee table in front of me when I got up to go to the door. I'm only 5 foot 3 and I knew not to open the door, so I grabbed a chair and stood on it to look through the peephole. That's when I got scared. On the other side was some guy, just standing there trying to open the door. Of course, being how I am, I tried to laugh myself out of being afraid because I had no reason to think he was going to do something to me. Maybe he just had the wrong room. I'd never seen him before and I don't know everyone in the building personally, but I had seen them all at least once, and he wasn't one of them. Hey man, I think you got the wrong room. He froze, his eyes glued to the door handle, and then at the peephole. He probably could tell exactly where I was when I spoke. I swear we made eye contact and the whites of his eyes were so yellow I thought he had jaundice. Then he all of a sudden started ramming his shoulder into the door, like full on shoulder ramming like in football. I jump off the chair and grab my phone and knife and run into a room with a window and lock the door. I call my mom's friend who lives in the apartment building across the street and start crying hysterically and said, Jess, someone's trying to break in, call the cops, bring Chris, please just get over here. She didn't even hesitate, I'll be right there. Within seconds of hanging up I call my mom. The guy is still hitting the door and he's yelling in frustration now. My mom picks up at after a few rings and I tell her what I told her friend and she was coming with Chris and she needed to get here quick. She was frightened and yelled that she was almost there. By the time I saw Jess make her way down two flights of stairs and across the road with her boyfriend, my mom was flying down the road and was there within mere seconds of me calling. They all race inside and I hear everyone yelling in the hallway. I unlock the door and peek outside of the apartment and see Chris holding the guy against the wall while my mom hugs me and Jess is screaming at him. Long story short, the police arrived and took my statement, and the man first denied it by saying, I thought it was my room, but then he ended up confessing that he wanted to see me and talk to me because he thought I was pretty. The police officers had him in handcuffs and ran a background check on him and what came up wasn't surprising. He had a warrant for an assault charge on a woman and had been arrested for kidnapping. 
yeah, I hope I don't have to experience that again. I was 19 years old and the only female working at a shop specializing in automotive batteries and things of that nature. I had been working there long enough to realize that most of the clients were male and oftentimes made for some awkward situations. For instance, I would get talked down to and patronized quite a bit or flirted with to the point where I would be somewhat uncomfortable. However, this never really bothered me. One day during a particular busy rush, a very tall man who was maybe in his mid-30s came through my line. This guy had some very strange energy, he seemed a little off. However, it was my job to be professional and assist whoever came through my line. I brushed aside the uneasy feelings. I just wanted to ring this guy out and get him through the rest of the line that was now trailing out the front door. I greeted him and talked to him as I would any other customer while I was processing his transaction. Things were going fine until he realized I was almost done. He started stalling, making up weird excuses as to why he couldn't use certain credit cards, how he needed me to put his battery on hold and he would be back, etc. I told him that I would hold it for him and that he could come back whenever he found the time. I figured he would leave at that point but he just stood there and just stared at me. Now that I think about it, he was more staring through me than at me. I was a bit uneasy but kept my polite, professional demeanor. Sir, if you're not purchasing anything at the moment, may I ask that you step aside so I can assist the other customers, I said. He completely disregarded my question and, in a slow, raspy voice, asked, So, what's your name? I didn't wear a name tag specifically for reasons like this. Customers had found me on Facebook before and it was really unsettling. Thinking quickly, I threw up my nickname. It's Rhea. Rhea, he said, as he kept staring. I just smiled awkwardly and said, Yep, that's me. By this point, my manager had realized what was going on and he proceeded to ask the man to step aside as well. After hearing it from my manager, the man walked to a corner of the store by some shelving and continued to stare while I was ringing the rest of the customers out. A bit of time went by and the line had cleared up but he was still standing there, staring and now smiling the most sickening smile I think I've ever seen. It made my skin crawl. Of course, my manager and coworker saw this too and my coworker grabbed my arm and said, come on, let's go out back. As we were walking to the stock room, my manager asked the man if there was anything else he needed. The man muttered that there wasn't and left. I wish that was the end of it, but of course he had to come back and to purchase the battery. When he came back the next day, we again had a line. He let people go ahead of him and waited until I was free before coming up to the counter to make his purchase. I greeted him again and tried to remain professional, but it was hard considering how creeped out I was. I was again met with the same stare and the same freaky smile. I can't remember the entire conversation, but at one point, the questions he was asking became personal slash weird slash inappropriate enough for my coworker to cut in. He looked at the guy and then at me and said, Rhea, go take your break, before he basically pushed me out the way of the computer and rang the guy out. I stayed in the back until my manager came and got me, telling me it was safe to come out. We were all pretty creeped out, but thought that was the end of it. A few days went by and we had all mostly forgotten about this creepy dude until he walked in again. This time though, he didn't look through the store, didn't approach the counter didn't say a word to anyone. He just stood, jacked hood pulled over his head, in the corner of the store, staring and smiling. The smile had become even wider and more sinister looking and at this point I started to freak out. I started shaking and feeling sick to my stomach. Then my manager cut the horrible tension by pretty much screaming at the guy. Hey, I'm sick of you coming into my store and pulling this crap. The creep paid him no mind and kept right on staring. This pissed my manager off and he walked out from around the counter and told the dude, Look man, if you don't quit coming in here and staring at her, I will not hesitate to call the cops. What you're doing is harassment so you need to get out of my store. At the mention of police, this dude's smile dropped and he slowly sauntered out of the store. We never saw him again, but I was immediately taken off closing shifts due to fear that the man would come back and try to catch me when I was alone. About three years ago, I was in a long distance relationship with a younger man, meaning he was only 17 at the time while I turned 19 in the relationship. His name is Peter. Peter was not a nice person to say the least. He thought that the first impressions he made on people were the only one he needed and as such he stopped being nice, polite, or reasonable to people after the first meeting. I was young and saw past this thinking I could somehow change him. However, this abuse towards people around me and myself eventually became too much and I broke off the relationship with him. The breakup went smoothly all things considered, except he wanted me to say the words so he could play the victim. This had been a core element of our fighting because he hinted that he would wanted to break up, but instead of just saying it, he kept me on the hook and became even more abusive. I'm getting sidetracked, but the point was that I thought of the matter as resolved and entered a loving relationship with my current boyfriend shortly after this. Then came the day where Peter wanted to get his belongings back. I texted him a list of everything he had left in my apartment and he okayed that it was everything. We also made an appointment for him to stop by my apartment around 3pm the following Thursday. I have no intentions of letting him get back into my house nor being alone with him, since he suddenly seems to have many mood swings after seeing me in another relationship. He has been blocked from my Facebook account, but somehow knew I was in a new relationship, which was a major red flag to me and my boyfriend. Thursday came and I felt eager just to be done with it. My boyfriend and I are walking home from high school when my phone rings. It's Peter. 
He yells at me that he has now been waiting at the train station for over an hour. I try to reason with him, agree to meet him there with his belongings since he needs to catch a train. My boyfriend walks with me to the train station, but we arrive only to find it vacant. I live in a small town and the train station is mostly used during rush hours in the morning and evening. It is also located rather bizarrely among normal residences and there are a lot of off alleyways leading all over town from there. I get a text stating that Peter can see us, but won't come out of hiding when my boyfriend is there. We leave his stuff on a bench at the train station, calmly replying that I'm not actually interested in meeting him. When I say calmly, I mean that my reply is calm. I'm shaking and my boyfriend is furious over this child's play. On our way home, I receive another text. This time, he states that he has a gift for me and it is in my mailbox. This freaks us out even more, mostly because this indicates that he might be waiting at my home. It is entirely possible that he watched us on the train station and then ran all the way to my apartment. However, there is no trace of him and nothing except a bill in my mailbox. By now, we figure that he is acting out of spite and proceeds to ignore the bombardment of text, calls, and so forth that follows that day. After a while, life returns to normal. Then I get another call, this time from my ex-elder brother who is worried about his sibling. Apparently he has disappeared, taking one of his brother's gas pistols. I am speechless, but since I haven't seen anything, I shake it off as another childish act. The same day my boyfriend sees police officers walking around the basement staircase on the exterior of the house we lived in, while doing some grocery shopping. He did this every day around 4pm. The next day, we are contacted by my boyfriend's mother. In the newspaper, there is a description of an unnamed young man from the same town as Peter, who has been arrested for attempted robbery of the pizza place I lived above. He was armed with a knife, a gas pistol, and lighter fluid, while stating that he was not attempting a robbery, but was there to visit his ex, presumably me. Contacting the police, I discovered that he also had a mask fake papers, and a wig and a duffel bag, which he had thrown down in the staircase when, around 4pm, he had jumped a fence and tried to enter the pizza place. This means that my boyfriend went out at the front door, while my ex was hiding right beside the front door armed. I have never been that freaked out before. The sad truth is that my ex never got charged with anything because he is a minor, has a father with a military background and money. Luckily after this, me nor my boyfriend ever saw him again. So this happened when I was in 7th grade, a 12 year old kid. At the time it was just my mom, my brother, and I living in a rental in a rundown low income area. We moved in during the summer before the school year started, and we were welcomed by our next door neighbors which wasn't too uncommon but not super common at the same time for that area in Oregon. My mom worked 8am to 5pm every day, so my little brother and I would ride the bus home every day from school. My cousin would also sometime ride back to my house with us and her parents would pick her up later, important for later. One day when I came home I noticed our small laptop we owned was gone off the counter. I figured my mom had moved it. Later when my mom came home later we determined it was missing and that a lot of other things were missing like my iPod and wallet and my mom's safe with her handgun in it and lots of family valuables. We called the cops and reported a robbery and they came to investigate. They determined the person probably slid through the doggy door leading into the garage and then entered the house through our unlocked garage door. Cops stayed in their cars on the curb all night and said they would stay on watch for our house more than normal. I was terrified all night and my brother and I slept in my mom's room. The next day we locked all our doors. It was Wednesday and it was a random half day at my school so I rode the bus home around noon and my cousin came with while my brother went to a friend's house for the afternoon to hang out. I used the key under the mat my mom leaves for me, and my cousin and I hung out for about an hour or two until her mom came and picked her up. After she left, I hear the doorknob of the closet right next to the front door slowly open and now comes the skinny, what looked like a 35 year old man that I recognized as our next door neighbor. He seemed to be constantly shaking, intense eyes, had a really unhealthy look to him because of the extremely sunken face. Terrified, I'm in the living room just standing looking at him while he looks at me, with a surprised look on his face. I think he thought everyone left when my cousin did, until his face changed to an amused smirk when I believed he realized that I was alone in his house. He begins to walk towards me while I stand there shocked, not sure what to do. He grabs me really hard on the shoulders. He seemed crazy and excitable with his intense eyes. I instinctively jump and buckle my knees to allow my full weight to be the force that rips me from his grip and fall down. He then bends down for me when I heel kick him as hard as I can. He then yells and falls to his knees. I use that time to run past him to my front door. I open it and run to a kid I rode the bus with's house about six houses down. He and his mom were there and she called the cops and my mom while I waited. The cops got to the house and he wasn't there but had managed to steal a few more small valuables. I gave my testimony that it was our next door neighbor and he was later caught the same day selling some of our stuff at the pawn shop in town. He ended up being a crystal meth addict, stealing our stuff to sell and pay for his addiction. He was super weak from all the drug abuse which is probably why I was able to get away from him. He also was apparently somewhat high when he spontaneously decided to attack me being that I was alone. 
He had apparently watched us for a few months, learning our schedules from when we left and got home. He took the time to take the key from under the front door mat while we were gone, get a copy, and then put the original back under the mat for my brother and I to use when we got home. The cops were surprised he was smart enough to do that, as he seemed to be mostly dim-witted with everything else due to the drug abuse. Either way, I testified against his physical attack, and he got a few decades of jail time being that he was already on parole for drugs. I was terrified and slept in my mom's room for the next year. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. About 25 years ago, when I was in middle school, 7th grade, I had a real bad problem with bullies. I couldn't handle the ridiculing I took while riding the school bus, so I started walking 3 miles to and from school every day. The path I walked was pretty safe, mostly on a sidewalk and always on a busy road, with the last 2.5 miles being a straight shot directly to the school. Back then, there wasn't a stigma attached to kids being outside on their own, so this wasn't deemed unsafe or noticed by anyone, or so I thought. I lived alone with my father, parents being divorced, and my mother saw me on weekends. He didn't see any harm in the walking and my mother wasn't aware of the bullying or the walking. I did not want her to know, so I continued unimpeded for over half the school year. Now, I wasn't really an active kid and I sure didn't like having to walk 6 miles every school day, so I assumed this was the motivation for the error I was about to make. One day on the way home, a car pulled up on the shoulder and stopped, about 100 feet ahead of me. That car looks familiar, hey it's my father, he's gonna drive me the rest of the way. I started to jog up to the car, seeing him in the driver's seat waiting patiently. Huh, his hair looks darker than normal today. Wasn't the inside of his car tan and not red? The thoughts left as soon as they entered and I caught up to the car and opened the passenger side door and started to get in. As I was tossing my backpack on the floor in front of me and swinging my legs into the car, I started saying thanks dad, but the sentence never completed. Before I knew it, I had shut the car door and we began to move. This isn't my father. This man was much older, by at least 20 years, hair obviously dyed black, and hands propped at 10 and 2 on the steering wheel. The shirt he was wearing looked just like one my father would have worn. A short sleeved collared button down, brick red with black horizontal lines, not pressed but not too wrinkled either. He was smiling at me, which probably would have felt warm if it was coming from my grandfather, but instead it felt menacing. I heard a click and looked over at the door, which had just been locked. I stared at the door for a moment longer, then turned to face front and completely froze, terrified. Hello, I saw you walking. I figured I'd come give you a lift. I did not move or answer. His voice matched his smile, deceivingly friendly. We were roughly a mile away from home, and half a mile from the next turn needed to head in that direction. All I could concentrate on is how I was going to get out of the situation. Are you on your way home? The snap to me a little out of my zone. Yes, I want to go home, I answered. Stay calm, talk normally, don't act scared. Where is your house? I can take you there. Feeling just slightly relieved, I told him to take the next right turn. I felt myself begin to breathe and I realized how tense I had been. My body relaxed slightly and I finally moved and wrapped my hands around my backpack straps. We started to come up on the intersection and I pointed ahead, reiterating that this was my turn. Okay, but if you want, we could take a ride instead. It sounded like a question, but it didn't feel like one. The dotted line for the turn lane had begun, but he did not get over. Instantly, I tensed back up and my grip and my gaze on the backpack straps tightened. Through strained muscles, I choked out that, no, no, I really need to get back home. He swung the car into the turn lane and began to make the turn. Wide-eyed, I glanced up and verified that yes, indeed, we were making the turn. Are you sure? I'll make sure you get home before anyone realizes you're gone. Grip tightening further, I abruptly stated that no, I need to get home now. My father is expecting me home now. He's waiting. I just hoped it sounded more convincing than it sounded to me. We completed the turn. Sigh. Okay, maybe next time. We can meet at the same place tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow's good. I just need to get home today. Now. My eyes were firmly trained on the road ahead of us, hoping that if I just focus on the direction to home, I would get there. The turn until my neighborhood was approaching and I informed him, again pointing towards the direction. The direction home. The next few moments were silent. As we came upon the turn, I reminded him and to my slight surprise and incredible relief, he made the turn. For the first time, I had more hope than doubt. My old neighborhood consisted of mainly apartments, but in the back were a block of townhouses, which is where I lived. If you were unaware of the layout of the complex, the townhouses might go unnoticed. Right before we got to the area where I lived, I told him here, stop here. He pulled over to the side of the road in front of an apartment building. He unlocked the door and I hurried out of the car, backpack still in hand. I began to close the car door behind me. See you here tomorrow, same time. I paused for just a second and risked another look at the man. Still smiling, still terrifying. Yes, tomorrow, see you later. I finished closing the door and hurried off. I swung my backpack on the right way and briskly walked into the opposite direction of my house. I could hear the car still idling behind me and it wasn't until I was able to turn off that road and leave his view that I heard him start to move. He had to drive up to where I was walking to turn around and I glanced back as he was making an awkward turn instead of going around the block to leave. He caught my gaze and gave a slight wave before driving off. 
My hand was in the reluctant process of waving back, but I was slow enough that he was gone before I completed the motion. I turned my head and kept walking, and the moment I could no longer hear his car, I ran. As fast as my legs and heavy backpack would let me, I ran around to where I could hide between two buildings and hid there for a while, until I felt enough time had passed for me to feel confident he was not driving around waiting looking for me. It was probably 30 minutes, but it felt like hours to me at the time. I ran the rest of the way home, keeping a lookout, making sure he couldn't see me going through the backyards. I reached my front door, unlocked it, and almost spilled inside. I was moving so fast. It wasn't until I locked the door behind me that I felt safe. I didn't feel scared anymore. I was home. In the end, I told both my parents, and my mother forced my father to drive and pick me up from school for the remainder of the school year. And luckily for me, the bullying stopped the next year. My father didn't believe me and thought I made up the story to get out of walking to school. In his defense, me trying to explain that, no, the car was exactly like yours, except the entire color of the inside, and no, he did look like you, just with darker hair, and it all happened so fast. It was worth his disbelief and annoyance every day in the car, so I never had to meet that guy again. So this happened when I was 16, visiting my grandma, who lives in a small town in Poland. Just for context, it was summer and my family wasn't with me at the time. As you can imagine, living without my parents for a short time, my grandma's really chill was a dream. I could stay out late as much as I wanted to without my parents being able to prove it. Now at 16, you feel you're invincible. You don't really think about how many screwed up people there are in this world. Because of this mindset, I wasn't worried about walking alone at night. The day on which the story takes place was very hot. I remember shopping and hanging out with my friends until about 8pm when it started to rain. Instead of walking home quickly, I decided to visit my aunt's house, hang out with my cousin for a bit, and walk home when the rain stopped. Well, I lost track of time and ended up leaving her house at about 10.30pm. At this point, the rain had mostly stopped, and this being my favorite type of weather, I declined my aunt's offer to drive me back, telling her I was getting a cab. I'm still surprised she believed this, but maybe she just didn't care. So I went on my way, called my grandma to tell her I'd be home in 30 minutes, but not telling her that I was walking alone. If there was one thing that scared me, it were the huge train tracks which you had to cross in order to get to my grandma's house the fastest, so I decided to take the longer way around through some sort of nature preserve. I'm not sure how to call it. I enjoyed my walk through the light rain until the long metal bridge came into my view. Just as it's beginning, I saw a man. It was a small quiet town, so it wasn't common for the people here to be out this late, but I wasn't scared immediately. I only saw his back, but he looked like every other guy you'd pass by on the street. He didn't seem to notice me, and I didn't really care. I got distracted by looking at the trees to my left, but when I came to the beginning of the bridge, the man was nowhere to be seen. I suddenly stopped dead in my tracks and got an ominous feeling. This man couldn't have already been out of view. It would have been impossible for him to move this fast. He would have had a run and I definitely would have heard him running on the metal bridge. At the end of the bridge, there was a small path that led under it, which was hidden by thick bushes. I got even more scared by the thought that he was hiding there, waiting for me. I slowly started to walk backwards, not taking my eyes off the bushes. I hid behind a tree and decided to wait a few minutes to see if he was hiding there. After about 10 minutes, my biggest fear came true. Suddenly, the man emerged from the bushes, looking in my direction. He was holding something big and shiny. I could make out in the dark that it was a knife. My mind started racing with a thousand questions. How did he see me? Why didn't I see the knife before? Where was he hiding it? He suddenly started to run in my direction, so fast. He ran straight past me hiding behind this tree and I was so relieved. When he was out of sight, I ran faster than I ever ran not stopping to look behind me, being frightened the whole way back thinking that he'd somehow find me and do whatever sick thing he had in mind. Luckily, I arrived home safely, my grandma waiting for me already mad. Looking back, this is one of the most stupidest things I could have done because of what happened a month after this incident. Two teenage girls about my age were stabbed dozens of times by this bridge. One body was found about 30 meters from it and the other one was thrown into the nearby river. To this day, nobody knows who did it, but I'm pretty sure that it was the same man whom I've encountered. For context, this took place when I was 16 years old. I'm 24 now, so it's been a while, but this was one of the many stupid things I've done in my life where I could have ended up dead or even worse. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and me and my friends would often go to the Lloyd Center to go shopping or just to hang around the food court being degenerates. I was walking around the mall with my friend Crystal and my mom when a man at a pop-up kiosk stopped us. He said that he represented a modeling company and wanted to talk to us about modeling for their clothing line. I considered myself better looking than the average duck, spoiler alert, I am about as plain jean as they come, and so I promptly announced that I wanted to sign up for the modeling agency, which my mom quickly shut down. I replied with a why, which got me in trouble later down the line with both parents, but that was the only start of my woes. I convinced my mom to allow me and Crystal to go off on our own and with a reluctant sigh, she allowed us to go off. Me, being the dumb kid I was, marched right back to over to the modeling agent and signed myself up with a phone number and email address. 
He said that he would be back in contact with me shortly to set up an interview with the company. That night, I went home and saw that I had a friend request from someone that shared no mutual friends with me. Hesitantly, I added the person and a message popped up. Hi, I'm such and such from the modeling company. You signed up with our agent earlier today and I wanted to get in touch with you. I know you're in the Portland area, so we wanted to set up an interview with you next week at 9pm at this location. Are you able to come speak to us? I responded with a maybe and logged off my computer. That's when my phone started to ring. I picked it up and it was yet another guy from the agency. This new agent asked me whether or not I could come and do the interview. I said maybe and bid him farewell. It was about here that my gut instinct started to kick in. Why would they set up an interview so late at night? And I googled the address and it was in an industrial park by the airport. I chose not to answer the onslaught of emails, Facebook messages, and phone calls that I was getting. This went on for about a week before I got radio silence. The guy on my Facebook blocked me, there were no more emails or calls. It was at this point I began to worry. What if I had allowed my crew to not even blossom, let alone flourish? What if I had made a mistake? I was already in hot water with my father for telling my mom off at the mall the first time. So with school in my mind, I allowed the idea to fade from my mind of what could have been. About two weeks later, our home phone started to ring. My father answered the phone and as soon as he started listening to the message, his face became ash and he instantly hung up the phone, turning me to demand what I had done. I tried to feign innocence, but I knew the jig was up. We had just gotten a phone call from the Portland Police Department to warn our family about ring of traffickers who were targeting young girls with promises of modeling and acting. They had stumbled upon the name of one of the men who worked for the ring and through that started contacting families of young women whose information they had gotten a hold of. The worst part of it all, they had my family's address and home phone number as well. I was grounded for the rest of the year, which was to be expected, but it was better than being carted off to some trafficking ring, so I couldn't complain. When I was finally allowed back to the mall with my friends, we walked by the kiosk where the modeling agent once peddled his false hopes and dreams. All that was left was an empty booth. This happened about four years ago. I had just graduated from high school and was a month and a half into summer break. Needing money for college, I began working full time for the school district I had just graduated from. Due to a music festival I wanted to attend as well as monetary concerns, I did not go with my family to North Carolina, which was fine by me. What 18 year old doesn't want a house to themselves for a week? Furthermore, my parents house is out in the country, so I had little to no fear about my neighbors complaining about parties or being bothered in any way whatsoever, but I was wrong. I often take the back roads home from my friend's house, but on that night I decided I wanted some McDonald's, so I took the main drag and came home on a different route. This way takes you past a mechanic shop not a mile away from our cul-de-sac. It was between midnight and 1am and as I passed the mechanic shop I noticed a car's lights turning on. Or should I say light, for this car had only one headlight working. I remember thinking that it was strange that this car all of a sudden turned its lights on as I was passing, and began to become even more concerned when it pulled out behind me. But I tend to be paranoid by nature, nothing serious but I always question the person behind me is following me and whether they mean me harm, so I brushed this off as an unfortunate coincidence. But as I neared my street and the car was still tailing me, I started to become freaked out. I looked at my gas tank and my heart sunk as I saw I was on E. Either I pull up my street and go home, or I risk driving around some and seeing if this dude follows. Yet that option held the risk of my car running out of gas and leaving me stranded on the road and I figured I'd rather take my chances on my own soil than on the side of some dark and lonely country back road. So I turned onto my street only to have my heart sink when the one headlamp car makes the turn right behind me. At this point I know I'm screwed. With nothing left to do I began pulling up my driveway. It's a hill about 100 yards long. To my utter horror they begin to follow me up. Looking back, I should have called the cops, but there was no love lost between law enforcement and myself and at the time, I was too caught up to even consider calling them. If my family would have been home, this would have never happened. I could have called my dad and he could have grabbed his gun, but he along with the rest of my family were gone, 12 hours away at the beach. So when they began to drive up my driveway after me, I stopped to put my car in reverse. They responded by reversing as well, yet they stopped at the bottom, effectively blocking my driveway. At this point, I pulled forward again only to have the same jig and dance happen. They followed, I reversed, they reversed, and set at the end, blocking my escape. I quickly pulled up and turned my car around to come at them head on. By this time, they were halfway up my driveway, the furthest they had come up. Looking back, I was terrified, alone, and angry. Who did this person think they were? With my brights on and shining right into their face, I opened my car door and got out. 
I pulled out my pocket knife and held it in my left hand while I grabbed my hammer in my right. I used to keep one in between my seer and door. In some weird desperate mindset, I made a split second decision to grab the hammer from the head with the handle sticking out. My hope was that it would be mistaken as a gun. I began yelling at points of my hammer slash gun at the car, screaming at them to get out and what do you want, all the while I held my hammer as a gun and prayed they would fall for it. Whether they did or not, I cannot say. Part of me believes they thought it was a gun due to my brights being behind me making my whole front side a shadow, yet they could could have just not wanted a fight. Perhaps they thought I was a girl or was timid and wouldn't resist so aggressively and violently. Who knows but it worked. They slowly backed out of my driveway and crept around the cul-de-sac. As they were leaving my street, I ran after them hiding behind my neighbor's houses and at every driveway the car would slow down to a near stop, as if scoping out the houses. Thankfully, they didn't pull into any driveways and they turned off my street altogether. After I was safely in my house, I ate my McDonald's by the front window with all the lights turned off, waiting to see if they'd come creeping back. Thankfully, they didn't, but that night I locked every door in the house, which I always did anyways, and slept with a hammer, machete, and baseball bat next to me and my pocket knife under the pillow. Complete overkill I know, but I was terrified. Now I know where my dad keeps his gun, so if it ever happens again, I'll be better prepared. Last year, I was dog sitting for my aunt. The dog is small, sweet, and a little skittish. I had worked most of the week, so I was just living in the house for the time being. It's a nice house, not big enough to feel empty if you're alone, but not small enough to feel cramped. The only rooms I used were the kitchen, bathroom, living room, and the guest bedroom. My last day of work this particular week was a double shift. I was excited because after this I had two days off. I planned on using them to introduce the dog to RuPaul's Drag Race. I usually try to keep good spirits for a double shift because regardless of the time and annoying customers, extra money is always needed. My old job was a barista and cashier. Mornings are always busy and nights are slow. On weekends, people are more concerned with coffee and breakfast than anything else we may have to offer. I was having a nice time, actually, because this day was turning out to be not as hectic as the previous ones that week, one even involving a small fire. As their morning rush line was dwindling, the limited tables in the restaurant came into view and I started people watching. As I slowly scanned the customers eating bagels and reading the paper, my eyes met a man at a laptop. He had long, dirty hair and a bit of a stubble. He stared at me with a little too much intensity. I wondered if he found my people watching rude, so I decided to clean and restock instead. It didn't take long for a line to reform, so I returned to my register. Once again, after the line died down, I could see the few tables in the front. The man was still there and he was still staring at me. Every now and then he would look at his computer and then back to me. It almost felt like he was looking right through me, or like he could see every part of me. It felt so uncomfortable that I went and cleaned in the back of the restaurant, out of his sight. After the next rush, I took my break and sat far away from the man. He was out of sight and I was out of his. When I came back from the break, the man was gone. My manager asked if I had interacted with him at all. I told her about him making eye contact with me, but that nothing else really happened. She told me that the man had been watching 18 plus content on his laptop and she had asked him to leave. So that was weird enough. The man had been watching that and stared at me. I really wish that this is where the story stopped. Hours passed and the rest of the day was entirely normal, despite me and a few female co-workers feeling a slight edge. We were in the process of closing, which is actually a process I really enjoy. We're well in and I'm almost done with my assigned jobs when my manager comes up to me again. She informs me that the man had found his way back in the restaurant at some point and she found him hiding in a back corner. She chased him out by threatening to call the police. She knew that earlier in the day, he seemed to be paying attention to me. She said I could finish up whatever I wanted or needed to, but afterwards she strongly advised me to get home as soon as possible. She also offered to walk me to my car. I took both offers and quickly got my things together and clocked out. My aunt's house was not far from work. It was a 5 minute drive at most, which was helpful because then I didn't feel the crippling anxiety for much longer. I got in the house and after triple checking that I had locked every door, got into my pajamas. But unsurprisingly, I was not ready to sleep yet. Now was the time to introduce the dog to RuPaul's Drag Race. I went into the living room. The living room consists of a couch, two chairs, a TV, a window, and the front door. Unfortunately, the porch light was broken and the window had no curtains. That had me a little stressed, but I was willing to take that over the only other TV in the house, which was the one that exists in the scary basement. Facing the basement TV included having my back to a sliding glass door facing the very dark woods. No thanks. I was setting up the TV when the dog started growling. I really didn't think much of it. As I said, the dog is skittish so he growls and barks all the time. I wasn't looking at him. I was muttering shush shush and figuring out how to work the TV. The dog didn't stop and started to get louder so I finally put down the remote and I turned to face the dog. I froze. The dog was barking at the window and there was an outline of a man at the window. The exact same build as the one at the restaurant. I screamed and luckily that was enough for the man to run away from the window. I stood there frozen for a while. The dog had calmed down but I hardly felt safe. So I went into the kitchen, grabbed a big knife and called my mom. 
She did not advise calling the police, my mom never does, and instead came and spent the night with me. I told my aunt. I spent the rest of my time dog sitting clutching the knife anytime I slept or took a shower. My aunt also gave me permission to have one friend stay with me every night. Nothing else ever happened. I never even saw the guy come into work again. A part of me wishes I knew who he was or where he went, or what he even wanted with me. I'm glad he was a coward and that all it took to scare him off was my scream and an extra small dog. The year was 1995 and I was 16 years old. I lived in a three bedroom, tooth bath house in a middle class suburban community with my mother, two younger brothers, and our 140 pound Doberman, Turbo. From the front door of our house, relevant, you could see directly into our living room which had an open concept floor plan with the kitchen and dining room. Our couch was on the wall directly in front of the front door. It was the summer between my sophomore and junior years in high school. My brothers and I spent a decent amount of time outdoors. I suppose anyone paying attention knew who lived in our house, and I suppose they knew that the only adult was gone when the only car was gone. However, prior to the man showing up at the house, I never noticed anything off, and I never noticed anything afterwards, so maybe we were just a random target. It was a Saturday and mom and the boys had run to the grocery store. In Nevada in the 90s, almost no one had air conditioning, so to cool off, you would open up all the windows and doors and use fans. On this particular day, I had the back sliding door and front door wide open to get a cross breeze. Neither screen door was locked. I was napping on the couch in full view of the front door in shorts and a tank top with unlocked doors. In my defense, there was 140 pounds of protective dog muscle on the floor next to me, and probably only for that reason am I alive. Around the approximate time I expected my family home from the store, Turbo began barking. Assuming he was barking their arrival, I told him to shush and try to go back to sleep. Turbo continued to bark, becoming more and more intense and even aggressive with his barking. Finally, after 5-10 to 10 minutes of Turbo refusing to quiet and my family never coming in from the car, I sat up, realizing something was wrong. A man who I didn't know stood, seemingly frozen, staring at my frenzied and barking Doberman. Assuming that the man had some appropriate business at my home, I hurried the 10 steps to the unlocked screen door, constantly shushing Turbo. I apologized for my dog and for not hearing his knock. He never knocked. The man explained that he was from the phone company and he was here to check our lines. He never took his eyes off Turbo. Turbo never stopped snarling. I leaned forward far enough to see the street. Only unmarked, privately owned cars lined the street. I looked at the man who was dressed in tennis shoes, jeans, and a t-shirt. I was 16 and dumb enough to nap in front of an unlocked door, but I was no fool. Phone company personnel A, always wear uniforms, B, always drive company vehicles, and C, don't come without being called, and D, don't work weekends. I looked at the man who had yet to look up from the 140 pound dog that was now foaming at the mouth. I grasped the screen door handle and held it. This got his attention. He met my eyes as I said, you have 30 seconds to show me identification or I'll open this door. I don't even think he made an incoherent excuse as he ran away. I fell to my knees and hugged Turbo. I then gave him all the meat in the fridge. I believe with absolute certainty that I would have been attacked if we hadn't had him. I like to think that if I hadn't had a huge, overly protective dog, I would have been in the habit of locking doors. But what would a screen door latch do against an intruder? And that creep stood there and watched me for 5-10 to 10 minutes. Perhaps he was paralyzed in fear, but maybe he was working his angles and only Turbo's insistent display of his willingness to kill anyone who threatened to be changed his mind. That's my theory. Turbo is long past but his legacy lives on, and two loving, loyal, and lethal, when necessary, dogs sleep in my room every night. For context, I'm a 5'3", 24-year-old female and working as a programmer for an IT company in the Philippines. Now the area where my office is in compromises of three buildings, Building A, where my office is in, Building B, and Building C. To get to the other building, it would take you like around 10 minutes to get there, important for later. This happened to me a year ago around the end of February until March. I just got out of a bad breakup at the time and I really intended it just to focus on myself and not meet anyone yet. I just got out of work and it's around 7pm on a Friday night and went to my usual waiting spot, which has benches and is located at the back of our building near the entrance of the underground parking. For our company shuttle and Omar shuttle dispatcher is there. Now, I've known Omar for two years and is someone I consider now as a friend and we've been often chat about our lives, even the breakup with my ex then, and joke around. He's a 40 plus year old guy and he gives out this big fatherly vibe so he's really someone that I trust. That night, he was there and with someone new that I didn't recognize, our conversation went like this. Omar, oh hi. Good thing you're here, I would like you to meet someone since he told me he already wants to meet you for a long time now. And then this guy stood up and shook my hand. I greeted him as just to be polite and this new guy, let's name him Ray. 
He's average looking and a little shorter to my height, 5 foot 1 I think, and he instantly gave off an all 5 as soon as I shook his hand. I thought that would be the end of it, but he proceeded to talk to me for a few minutes while I wait for my shuttle to arrive. Omar has purposely left me and this Ray guy so that we could talk and get to know each other. I'm actually puzzled at this point because, 1. I have no clue who this guy is and why he would be so eager to meet me, and 2. I clearly told Omar before that I'm not into meeting anyone just yet. But for the sake of being polite and nice, I talked to Ray but we never reached any personal questions exchanging numbers, social media accounts, or even telling him my full name. I just told him my nickname, and I left it just as that when I finally got on the shuttle. Fast forward to a week and Friday again, I got off at work in the same time and surprise surprise, Ray is there again with Omar and his security guard. They were chatting but as soon as I came, Ray instantly greeted me and at this point, I'm a little creeped out as I expected our encounter would only be a one time thing. I just said hi and brushed him off and sat on the benches to wait for my shuttle again and of course, as this guy doesn't seem to know the definition of personal space, sat beside me and talked to me again but this time he's asking for my cell phone number. I told him off and clearly said that I'm not giving out my number to strangers and just giving him one word answers just to give an impression that I wasn't interested at all. He would ask, why wouldn't you give your number, I just want to be friends. And I could see it in his face that he was getting frustrated every time I told him I wasn't giving it to him. This happened while Omar and the security guard was looking at us from afar, but this went on until I got on the shuttle again. As soon as I got home, I mindlessly scrolled through my timeline and saw a notification that I have a new friend request and guess what? It's Ray and he even messaged me with a, please accept my friend request. I just deleted his request, but now I'm pretty shocked since I didn't tell him my Facebook account, so how did he manage to find me? The following day was the last straw when I decided to get off at an earlier time so that I could avoid him, but to my surprise, he was there, again waiting for me, along with Omar and the security guard. Ray immediately ran up to me to say hi, but I brushed him off and dreaded the fact that I would have to wait with this creep again when I saw my shuttle isn't there yet. He immediately asked me if I accepted his Facebook request, and I decided to play dumb and said I haven't been active on Facebook and I haven't seen any requests. He got disappointed and he fiddled with his phone for a bit and then revealed his phone to show my Facebook profile and asked me if this was me. I said yes, and this time, I was completely ignoring him at this point and playing with my phone and told him that I wasn't going to accept his request because I don't know him. And then Ray grabbed my phone out of my hands angrily and said he was going to add himself using my Facebook account if I won't. I muttered a what the and grabbed my phone from him and with perfect timing, I got on the shuttle in a hurry and told the driver to go. At this point, I could confirm that this guy could be stalking me and now knows my daily schedule and social media. Media accounts. I reported this incident to my manager and told her how this was already happening for some time now. She was surprised that I didn't report it earlier but I blamed it on my lack of assertiveness and fear that I might be overreacting to his advances. We reported the incident to office security and told them what happened and they couldn't do anything at first as, one, I need actual evidence about my allegations to him, and two, I only knew Ray by his first name and they would need more information than that. I didn't bother to ask where he's from or if he's even working in our office slash building which is dumb of me and I should have asked in the first place. My manager then decided that I should be at least accompanied by some of my office mates to confirm the situation and the guys volunteered to accompany me every time I got off work. They accompanied me for a couple days and no matter what time I got out, Ray was there to harass me. I felt bad for my office mates as they had to deal with his BS as well. First instance when he saw I was with my office mates, I could see the visible anger in his eyes and he would try to butt in our conversation even if we were ignoring him. At one point when I'm talking with my office mates, he let out an exasperated sigh and said, Can I talk to you for a second please? What do you want? I just want to talk to you. If you don't, I'll leave. Okay, and then I went back to talking to my office mates. He butted in once more and asked that I should introduce him to my office mates when I didn't. He proceeded to introduce himself instead which irked the heck out of my office mates and I as his behavior doesn't seem normal at all. After that incident, my office mates and I told my manager what happened and how dangerous this guy might be. She decided that we should escalate it to HR and have them deal with it immediately. Gladly, HR responded and took the situation seriously and began to do an investigation on who Ray might be. Same day, they sent an email that after searching through records, turns out Ray wasn't an employee at our office and they might need to talk to building security to find out more about this guy. HR also requested our office security to escort me and observe the situation. I honestly felt relieved as now I'll feel safe for the time being while they search for who Ray might be. He still showed up even if I got out late or earlier than usual, but never went near me when he saw I was accompanied by security but he would just keep his distance and stare at me, smile creepily and linger outside my shuttle until it left. HR contacted me for a meeting with him and my manager about some news on Ray and I was shocked by the information that they found out. Ray was not an employee of our building slash office, but in fact, 
attempt in the security office in building C. I then thought, okay, this creep is really putting an effort for someone who is clearly not interested and if he's attempt meaning there's a chance I won't be able to see him after this. But then what HR said chilled me to the bone. He was attempt assigned to work on the security cameras meaning he had access to all the building cameras. It has been his way to spy on me and the reason why he was able to be there at the exact same time I got out. HR has already spoken to his supervisor and gave a warning to Ray and of course, Ray denied the allegations even if I had witnesses against him. The supervisor wanted to apologize to me in person but I decided not to as I just wanted this to be over with. After that meeting, I never saw Ray again and I reckon he must have been kicked out after HR issued warning against him. As for Omar, I never seen him as well and I felt bad but he was also part of the people who enabled Ray and didn't do anything when I was clearly getting harassed. I received received a bit of backlash from the security guards at the building for a while as well. Hearing them say that I was overreacting and I should have accepted his advances, which was disgusting, as I heard the same thing being said by female building staff as well. Nothing strange happened for a few days, but then the security guard that was with Omar at the time, when Ray was harassing me, added me on Facebook, but I didn't make much of it and just deleted the request. I'm still working in the same office and building as of today and been totally shaken up by the incident that I decided just to keep my distance from people so I could avoid from this ever happening again and to Ray, please don't meet me again. Again. This story is of my brief friendship with a guy that near stalked me, and I'm sharing it for some closure, I think. I started my freshman year of college at a university in my hometown that's pretty nice. I'm not going to share too much about it, but it has a smaller amount of students but enough that you don't really run into people often. I lived on campus and I was only 17 at the time. I had Tinder of course, as I was fresh out of a relationship and looking to experience new things in college. I matched with this one boy, Asher, who seemed nice enough. Pretty socially awkward, but I never really minded because I have anxiety issues myself and I'm really sympathetic to it. Because of that, I ignored a lot of warning signs I shouldn't have. We texted for a while and he seemed really nice and caring. He wanted to know a lot about me, which I wasn't too keen on sharing, but I told him the basics and we texted kind of regularly. He lived on campus as well and invited me to hang out. At that time, things didn't seem too sketchy so I was completely down. When I first met him, that's when things started to get uncomfortable. We hung out in his dorm, which is pretty standard overall. I got cozy with him on his couch. I'd say almost cuddling, but not quite. Still, really standard. When we started talking more, I realized how uncomfortable things really were. He kept making comments that just put me off, but I tried to ignore them. Things like, I've never really cuddled with anyone before. Sorry if I'm doing it wrong and so many comments about how he already liked me a lot and wanted me to stay forever. Weird word choice, but whatever, he's just trying to be nice, I let him down easy. I ended that hangout pretty quickly for some fake excuse, and went right back to my room. He kept texting me and professing how much he was into me, and I told him sorry, but I'm not looking for any kind of relationship, so I do not want to keep things romantic. A bad lie, but I'm very non-confrontational and it didn't want to be mean. That's when things started to get really weird. He sent me this long paragraph saying about how it was okay I didn't want a relationship now, and that he'd wait for me to save his virginity for me. We had never talked about anything sexual, I had never really even told him I liked him or flirted back. I just never turned him down. It was one of the creepiest messages I've ever received. Unfortunately, this was just the start of all the things we were to come. He wouldn't leave me alone even though I kept trying to de-escalate things, and I kept running into him all over campus. I wasn't sure how he suddenly was nearby when my classes ended, and I wasn't sure why suddenly we'd both be in the dining hall at the same times, even though I hadn't changed my regular routine, but I just tried to brush it off. Definitely a mistake. I ended up turning him down completely because I was getting creeped out and couldn't figure out how he wasn't understanding that I didn't want anything romantic or sexual with him, telling me how he was going to off himself and no one was ever going to love him. I've been in a manipulative relationship in the past, and I recognized that behavior right away and shut it down. I told him I couldn't be friends with him, and in my head that was that. He didn't reply for a while, but when he did, everything broke loose. I was luckily out of town at the time for a concert, so that made me feel a lot better. He went off, sent me paragraphs after paragraph about how horrible of a person I was, and how I needed to get put in my place, etc. I could handle that, I just ignored it. Then, once the regret set in, he made it his mission to win my love however possible. He apologized profusely, told me how he couldn't be all alone and I was his only friend, and how much he loved me. Whatever, terrible, but I didn't care about that. Then, I guess to prove his dedication, he did the creepiest thing yet. First, he told me he was outside my room. We did not live in the same dorm building, and you can't get into the buildings unless you live there. I don't know who let him in. I wasn't there, and my roommate was out, so that was okay. I texted back at that point and told him to leave and how wrong and creepy that was, and he pulled out his last resort. He just sent me screenshots of my contact in his phone. On Apple devices, you could fill in tons of information and have a note section. Everything was entirely full. He knew my home address, my room number on campus, my parents' and brothers' names, my pets' names, my schedule. It was terrifying because I'm a fairly private 
private person. My Instagram is my only social media and I do not share that much on it. I don't think I'll ever find out how he discovered all that about me. I blocked him on everything right away and reported him to school. The school did nothing at all. I still see him on campus, but it seems like he doesn't care about me anymore gladly. I was around 16 years old when this happened to me. It was just me and my dad at our house, and since he was a businessman that traveled frequently, I was left home alone quite often. First of all, I'm going to try to do my best to describe you the layout of my house so you can better understand my situation. My house is pretty small since it's just my father, my dog, and me living in it. There's a long hallway full of full-size windows separating my dad's room and mine. Our dog loved to look out the windows, so we always kept them open enough for her to look out. I'm the last room at the end of the hallway, and between the two rooms is my bathroom and a spare room. All the rest is irrelevant. Let's get to it. It was around 11pm when the worst night of my life began. My dad was passed out in bed after a long day, and I was mindlessly dancing around my house getting ready for bed. I just hopped in my shower, not knowing what was coming ahead, when my dog starts aggressively barking up a storm. I walk out the bathroom and go out and explore. I head to my room to throw some clothes on while my dog is still barking. Months before, I'm not sure how I managed to break my door handle, but you don't have to twist the knob to open it, all it needs is a small push. Scared, I barely managed to put a shirt on when my dog opened the door. I looked to see her enter my room, while in the midst of barking that's when I saw it. There's only one window that has vision to the opening of my room, and in the corner of it I saw a face. It was dark, so I took a second to comprehend what I just saw, but when I finally realized it, I screamed. My dad owns lots of guns, so when he heard me scream, he ran out with a pistol. He asked me what happened and could barely mutter what I saw. He ran outside to see if the man with the terrifying face was still near. We stood out there for maybe a minute scanning the area. A man was casually strolling towards us from the opposite direction from about 100 yards away. I knew it was him. I got that feeling in my stomach that you can't mistake. It was like he was trying to cover up that he was there by coming from a different direction. But he didn't fool me. You better stay away from my daughter. You see what I have here, you know what this does. Holding up his gun, I could have sworn my dad was going to shoot. The man brushed these threats off easily. My dad and I went back inside. He went back to bed like nothing had happened, but I could not sleep a week. I kept thinking he was going to come back and hurt me because of the threats to him. We called the cops the next morning and they came and scoped out our house. He looked around the house trying to calm me down but I was still pretty shaken up. He went to the front yard and that's when he saw it. In front of the windows in the long hallway there were small bushes, nothing much. The cop from outside went to the window that had view of my room and there it was. If he tried to tell me the news without making me more upset, he failed. There were incidents in the dirt right in front of the window. That meant he knew where he needed to look for you and it seems as if he had come here more than once because of the broken pieces of bush and the divots in the ground. Turns out he was the nephew of my old neighbor and he had been staying there for months. Never rested, never got in trouble, probably barely got a slap on the wrist. But at least he's gone now. How long had he been watching me, I'll never know. All I know is I keep my door shut and I never keep the blinds open. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. To begin, I've always had this feeling that someone was watching me ever since I moved into my family house 8 years ago. At first I thought I was just being paranoid, but I could not help looking over my shoulder when I would walk to school or to my bus stop. When I would walk to school, I was always scared in the mornings when it would be dark during the winter or fall because where I live is just fast country lands. I live in Canada and although not much crime happens in my neighborhood, I never could rid myself of this eerie feeling. Even when I would come home from school, being home alone did not help. I would triple check my windows and locks to make sure everything was locked. However, in my basement, our garage door would never fully lock since the door hinge was broken and detached from the door, therefore it would never properly close. I always told my dad to fix this door but because he would always go away for work, he never found the time to do so. Stupidly, I thought nothing bad would happen since my garage needed a 4 digit passcode to get in. Now my theory is that he knew the passcode of my house, therefore he had free reign for 7 years to go through my things. At first I thought I was being forgetful, maybe I was the one who misplaced my underwear somewhere, maybe I was the one who misplaced my favorite top or maybe my dad accidentally donated it, but I should have known better. During my 4 years in high school he never really contacted me, it was when I went to university that things started to change. Since I live in the countryside I decided to go to a university an hour away. My dad did not want me to live on residence because he didn't want to leave the house unattended for long periods of time, so we came to the conclusion that it would be the best if I drive to and from school. Now I would leave for university very early in the morning, around 6am, and come back around 6pm at night. I stopped being aware of my surroundings at this time because I would be tired from my 12 hour days and now that I wasn't walking alone everything would be fine. When I would come home from university, I would find certain things moved in my house. I am a neat freak and I like things a particular way in my house. 
When little things like my makeup or candles would be moved, I thought it was odd and would frequently bring it up to my dad, but he would just say that it must have been me who was doing it, but it wasn't me. During my second and third year in university, I started getting weird notes in my mailbox. The writing on these notes looked almost childlike and it would always be written in blue ink. I have those country style mailboxes at the end of my driveway where the little red flag goes up whenever we get mail. From my way back from university, I would always check the mail and sometimes I would find these letters. The letters would never be long. In fact, they would only be one of three sentences that would contain odd questions like, Where are you? I wonder what you do while you're away from home. How do you find university? It must be tiring driving that long. Did you make new friends? Do you still hang out with your best friend? You dress differently now. Why is that? I miss the scarves you used to wear. You don't close your curtains as much anymore. Why don't you look for me? These letters would always come once a month at the beginning of the month. I would show my dad and at first he would say, oh maybe your cousins are just pranking you or it's probably your friends. But every time I would ask my friends or cousins, they would give me this confused response saying that they never sent me any letters. Now that I am in my fourth year at university, the letters do not come as frequently but two weeks ago something happened that makes me think that things are escalating. I came back home from university at 7.45pm and it was fairly dark outside. I saw that my mailbox flag was up so I checked the mail and it was just bills. At this point I haven't gotten a note for a little over three months now so I am thinking maybe the notes will not come anymore. As I settle in for bed I change into my pajamas and I check the locks usually. As I checked my front door lock I look out the glass panel on my door and I saw that the red flag on my mailbox is up. It's 10.30 at night so no way the mail could have gotten dropped off and plus I just checked the mail. I call my dad and tell him about it and he said not to freak out and that maybe one of our neighbors accidentally got our mail and just dropped it off since this happens frequently. I stay on the phone with my dad and quickly run down my driveway to check my mailbox. As I open the mailbox, I feel my heart drop because it's an unmarked manila envelope. I quickly run back inside and open the manila envelope and although there is no written note, I find something more disturbing. It is a pair of my old blue panties that I haven't seen in years. At this point I scream and my dad tells me to hang up and call my aunt who is a police officer. My aunt comes over and checks the inside and outside of my house but she can't find anything. She tries to jog my memory and ask if I know anyone who could be doing this but I honestly have no clue. My aunt told me to keep any more letters I get and she has been staying with me the days my dad is out for work. I just hope that we're able to find whoever this is. About two years ago when I was 17, I received a Facebook message from someone named Dan who I didn't recognize. I had mutual friends with him and he looked to be around the same age as me so I wasn't alarmed. What follows is the messages. Dan, hello, have you been? Haven't seen you in a few years. Me, hi, not trying to be rude but do we know each other? Dan, um, yeah, you really don't know me? I didn't respond. Dan, wow, real nice way to treat a family friend. Me, sorry I just don't recognize you. Dan then sent a picture of me and him together from when we were little. And I mean really little. Like I looked maybe two or three and he looked five or six. Me, oh wow, did our parents used to be friends or something? Dan, I was your neighbor. You really don't recognize me. Come on, I didn't move that long ago. He had in fact moved a long time ago. At least 12 years ago. So I honestly feel like it's not that uncommon for me to not recognize someone who I hadn't seen or talked about since I was four. Anyways, the conversation continued like that. I apologized for not remembering him and just started catching up. He was being nice enough and I was bored so whatever, no harm, no foul. After we kept talking, I started remembering more about him. Like I remembered him coming over and swinging in my backyard and me going over to his house with my big brother and all of us hanging out together. Dan was a few years older than me, at least two but I can't remember exactly. Anyways, we kept talking on Facebook just messaging back and forth about normal things until it started to get late and I was tired and at school the next day so I told him I was going to bed. I closed my computer and just laid down and went to sleep. The next morning I woke up to a bunch of messages from him. Things like good night beautiful and sweet dreams, message me when you wake up, are you asleep yet, can't wait to talk to you. Literally there was almost 50 messages. I was creeped out but I opened the messages and glanced through them and just didn't reply. On my phone I have it set to where I don't get notifications from Facebook Messenger. At the time I was in a lot of group chats with different team sports and group of friends so it was just easier to at the end of the day check my messages versus getting a ton of notifications all day long. Some point during the day I had gotten more messages from him that I just hadn't noticed while I was at school he was saying stuff like, do you still live at insert address here? I did still live there. Does your mom still freak out about you hanging with boys? My mom has never freaked out over boys. Let's go out and catch up. Let me take you out and treat you right. It just kept going on and on with really random questions that weren't necessarily threatening but just somewhat creepy. He then talked about wanting to go on dates even though he didn't even live in the same state anymore that I live in so I have no idea how he would have planned on going on dates with me. The messages just kept continuing over the next week him telling me he wants to go on dates and asking me really weird questions about my mom, my brother, and my house and then he started asking about his house that he used to live in. I didn't reply to any of his messages but I was getting at least 50 a day. 
Eventually, I brought it up to my mom and just asked her if she remembered Dan from next door. Her face completely drained of color and she got super serious all of a sudden and she asked me why I was bringing him up. I told her that he had messaged me on Facebook and was trying to get me to go out on a date with him and was just trying to catch up. I didn't tell her he'd been messaging me 50 plus times a day and I wasn't responding at this point. She told me to block him and never message him again. I asked her why and this is a summary of what she told me. When I was 3 or 4 I used to play over at his house a lot. His mom would always offer to babysit me if my mom had to go out and run errands and he also had a little sister who was around my age so my mom figured it was a perfect opportunity for a play date between Dan, my brother, me, and Dan's little sister. One day when I came home after one of these play dates, my mom was asking me and my brother what we had done that day. My brother started talking about how he had watched some movie. I apparently told my mom that Dan had brushed my hair for me. My mom thought that was a little weird that a 6 year old boy wanted to brush a 3 year old girl's hair so she asked a couple more questions and it came out that he wasn't brushing my hair. He had been taking a brush and was rubbing it all over my body while I was only in my undies. My brother didn't know anything about this because we had been in Dan's room and my brother had been in the living room with Dan's little sister. After that my mom didn't let me go back over to his house. Apparently when my mom confronted his mom about it, a huge fight broke out. Not physically, but a screaming match. It turns out that Dan had been doing similar stuff to his little sister, but it had escalated farther than that with me. My mom threatened to report them to the police or Child Protective Services. She did both, but before much could be done, they moved out and found somewhere else to live. They were renting the house. After hearing that from my mom, I immediately blocked Dan on Facebook. I wasn't quick enough, I guess, however, because he messaged a bunch of my friends on Facebook asking about me and had changed his relationship status to take it and in a relationship with me. He then followed me on Instagram and found my Snapchat somehow. He liked and commented on almost all of my Instagram pictures and sent me a bunch of Snapchats. I quickly blocked him on both and luckily he never figured out my phone number. Luckily I haven't heard from him since. We were both 16 and 13 respectfully. My sister and I were home alone while my parents were out of state for a couple of days to attend the funeral of a longtime family friend. Our grandfather lived only a couple miles away and was originally supposed to babysit us, but he trusted my sister and I would be fine, and he would be on call if anything were to go bad. Well, of course, something did. Just our luck. It was around 10pm or somewhere close to that on the second night and I was upstairs in my bed trying to sleep after a long day of biking around with a couple of friends. My sister suddenly came running up the stairs which she almost never did unless she was in a hurry for some reason. She came into my room and was frantically talking to someone on the phone. I lied there in confusion while she talked. I don't remember exactly what was said, but when she hung up, she hugged me and told me that everything was alright and that grandpa was on his way. What had happened was that my sister was sitting outside on our stoop talking to a friend of hers on the phone when a pickup truck came rolling onto our driveway. My parents don't own a pickup so I immediately threw up a red flag. Once she saw a man get out carrying a duffel bag, that's when she came running inside and called our grandfather. My grandfather may have been 60 at the time, but he's no pushover. Being 6 foot 4 and having the strength of Godzilla with a demeanor to match when it comes to protecting his loved ones. He also owns firearms, which I wouldn't doubt for a second he would bring alone in case something really hit the fan. We also lived in an area where the police would take a bit of time to reach, which is another reason why my sister called him and not the authorities. Suddenly, we hear what sounds like a door being kicked open downstairs. Almost immediately afterwards, we began barricading my bedroom door. Since none of the bedroom doors had locks them at the time. Once we're done, she looks at the window while I sit there, covering myself with my blanket, all the while we hear footsteps downstairs on our hardwood kitchen floor. My sister then looked around my room and asked if I had a bat or something, which I did in my closet. My Louisville slugger that I used when my parents made me play baseball when I was in elementary school. I also had a hockey stick, but who would use that as a weapon unless in a very circumstantial situation? She rummaged through my closet and found it, then stood next to the door while I ducked down behind her, thinking maybe I should grab the hockey stick, but it's much less intimidating than a bat. Unless this burglar has some sort of PTSD associated with hockey, then this is the ultimate weapon. We then hear the sound of a gunshot followed by a man yelling out in pain. The sound of both I can still hear even to this day when I think about it hard enough. My sister and I are standing by the door, almost sobbing when about a minute later, we then hear my grandfather yell out our names, asking if we were alright to which we both yelled out simultaneously that we were. My sister and I pulled the dresser and various other objects out the way of my door and we both went out into the hallway. We heard my grandfather on the phone with 911 as we stood at the top of the stairs. 
When the police and ambulance arrived, the man who had broken in was taken out on a stretcher, to which I later learned was shot in the abdomen. My grandfather had come in through the same back door and found the man in our kitchen looking through drawers. When he came at my grandfather with one of our kitchen knives, that's when he was shot. The man almost died from blood loss, but ended up surviving and I hope he's learned his lesson, both through being incarcerated and by being shot in the abdomen and almost losing his life. But, of course, you never know with certain people, especially the nefarious ones. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.